Section 5.4 I do not mean to allude to all the writers who have written on the subject of female manners. It would, in fact, be only beating over the old ground, for they have in general written in the same strain. But attacking the boasted prerogative of man, the prerogative that may emphatically be called the iron sceptre of tyranny, the original sin of tyrants, I declare against all power built on prejudices, however hoary. If the submission demanded be founded on justice, there is no appealing to a higher power, for God is justice itself. Let us then, as children of the same parent, if not bastardized by being the younger born, reason together and learn to submit to the authority of reason when her voice is distinctly heard. But if it be proved that this throne of prerogative only rests on a chaotic mass of prejudices that have no inherent principle of order to keep them together, or on an elephant, tortoise, or even the mighty shoulders of a son of the earth, they may escape who dare to brave the consequence without any breach of duty, without sinning against the order of things. Whilst reason raises man above the brutal herd, and death is big with promises, they alone are subject to blind authority who have no reliance on their own strength. They are free who will be free. The being who can govern itself has nothing to fear in life. But if anything is dearer than its own respect, the price must be paid to the last farthing. Virtue, like everything valuable, must be loved for herself alone, or she will not take up her abode with us. She will not impart that peace which passeth understanding when she is merely made the stilts of reputation and respected with pharisaical exactness, because honesty is the best policy. That the plan of life which enables us to carry some knowledge and virtue into another world is the one best calculated to ensure content in this cannot be denied. Yet few people act according to this principle, though it be universally allowed that it admits not of dispute. Present pleasure or present power carry before it these sober convictions, and it is for the day, not for life, that man bargains with happiness. How few, how very few, have sufficient foresight or resolution to endure a small evil at the moment, to avoid a greater hereafter. Woman in particular, whose virtue is built on mutual prejudices, seldom attains to this greatness of mind, so that becoming the slave of her own feelings, she is easily subjugated by those of others. Thus degraded, her reason, her misty reason, is employed rather to burnish than to snap her chains. Indignantly have I heard women argue in the same track as men, and adopt the sentiments that brutalize them with all the pertinacity of ignorance. I must illustrate my assertion by a few examples. Mrs. Piozzi, who often repeated by rote what she did not understand, comes forward with Johnsonian periods. Seek not for happiness in singularity, and dread a refinement of wisdom as a deviation 
into folly. Thus she dogmatically addresses a new married man, and to elucidate this pompous exordium, she adds, I said that the person of your lady would not grow more pleasing to you, but pray let her never suspect that it grows less so. That a woman will pardon an affront to her understanding much sooner than one to her person is well known, nor will any of us contradict the assertion. All our attainments, all our arts, are employed to gain and keep the heart of man. And what mortification can exceed the disappointment if the end be not obtained? There is no reproof, however pointed, no punishment, however severe, that a woman of spirit will not prefer to neglect. And if she can endure it without complaint, it only proves that she means to make herself amends by the attention of others for the slights of her husband. These are true masculine sentiments. All our arts are employed to gain and keep the heart of man. And what is the inference? If her person, and was there ever a person, though formed with Medicisan symmetry that was not slighted, be neglected, she will make herself amends by endeavouring to please other men. Noble morality. But thus is the understanding of the whole sex affronted, and their virtue deprived of the common basis of virtue. A woman must know that her person cannot be as pleasing to her husband as it was to her lover. And if she be offended with him for being a human creature, she may as well whine about the loss of his heart as about any other foolish thing. And this very want of discernment or unreasonable anger proves that he could not change his fondness for her person into affection for her virtues or respect for her understanding. Whilst women avow and act up to such opinions, their understandings, at least, deserve the contempt and obloquy that men who never insult their persons have pointedly levelled at the female mind. And it is the sentiments of these polite men who do not wish to be encumbered with mind that vain women thoughtlessly adopt. Yet they should know that insulted reason alone can spread that sacred reserve about the persons which renders human affections, for human affections have always some base alloy, as permanent as is consistent with the grand end of existence, the attainment of virtue. The Baroness de Stal speaks the same language as the lady just cited, with more enthusiasm. Her eulogium on Rousseau was accidentally put into my hands, and her sentiments, the sentiments of too many of my sex, may serve as the text for a few comments. Though Rousseau, she observes, has endeavoured to prevent women from interfering in public affairs and acting a brilliant part in the theatre of politics. Yet in speaking of them, how much has he done it to their satisfaction? If he wished to deprive them of some rights foreign to their sex, how has he for ever restored to them all those to which it has a claim, and in attempting to diminish their influence over the deliberations of men, how sacredly has he established the empire they have over their happiness, in aiding them to descend from an usurped throne, he has firmly seated them upon that to which they were destined by nature. And though he be full of indignation against them when they endeavour to resemble men, yet 
when they come before him with all the charms, weaknesses, virtues, and errors of their sex, his respect for their persons amounts almost to adoration. True, for never was there a sensualist who paid more fervent adoration at the Shrine of Beauty. So devout indeed was his respect for the person that accepting the virtue of chastity for obvious reasons, he only wished to see it embellished by charms, weaknesses, and errors. He was afraid lest the austerity of reason should disturb the soft playfulness of love. The master wished to have a meretricious slave to fondle, entirely dependent on his reason and bounty. He did not want a companion whom he should be compelled to esteem, or a friend to whom he could confide the care of his children's education should death deprive them of their father before he had fulfilled the sacred task. He denies woman reason, shuts her out from knowledge, and turns her aside from truth. Yet his pardon is granted because he admits the passion of love. It would require some ingenuity to show why women were to be under such an obligation to him for thus admitting love, when it is clear that he admits it only for the relaxation of men and to perpetuate the species. But he talked with passion, and that powerful spell worked on the sensibility of a young encomiast. What signifies it, pursues this rhapsodist, to women, that his reason disputes with them the empire when his heart is devotedly theirs? It is not empire but equality that they should contend for. Yet if they only wish to lengthen out their sway, they should not entirely trust to their persons. For though beauty may gain a heart, it cannot keep it, even while the beauty is in full bloom, unless the mind lend at least some graces. When women are once sufficiently enlightened, to discover their real interest on a grand scale, they will, I am persuaded, be very ready to resign all the prerogatives of love that are not mutual, speaking of them as lasting prerogatives, for the calm satisfaction of friendship and the tender confidence of habitual esteem. Before marriage, they will not assume any insolent airs, nor afterward abjectly submit, but endeavouring to act like reasonable creatures in both situations, they will not be tumbled from a throne to a stool. Madame Jean Lee has written several entertaining books for children, and her letters on education afford many useful hints that sensible parents will certainly avail themselves of. But her views are narrow, and her prejudices as unreasonable as strong. I shall pass over her vehement argument in favour of the eternity of future punishments, because I blush to think that a human being should ever argue vehemently in such a cause, and only make a few remarks on her absurd manner of making the parental authority supplant reason. For everywhere does she inculcate not only blind submission to parents, but to the opinion of the world. She tells a story of a young man engaged by his father's express desire to a girl of fortune. Before the marriage could take place, she is deprived of her fortune and thrown friendless on the world. The father practices the most infamous arts to separate his son from her, and when the son detects his villainy and, following the dictates of honour, 
marries the girl, nothing but misery ensues, because forsooth he married without his father's consent. On what ground can religion or morality rest when justice is thus set at defiance? In the same style, she represents an accomplished young woman as ready to marry anybody that her mamma pleased to recommend, and as actually marrying the young man of her own choice without feeling any emotions of passion because that a well-educated girl had not time to be in love. Is it possible to have much respect for a system of education that thus insults reason and nature? Many similar opinions occur in her writings, mixed with sentiments that do honour to her head and heart. Yet so much superstition is mixed with her religion, and so much worldly wisdom with her morality, that I should not let a young person read her works unless I could afterwards converse on the subjects and point out the contradictions. Mrs. Chapone's letters are written with such good sense and unaffected humility and contain so many useful observations that I only mention them to pay the worthy writer this tribute of respect. I cannot, it is true, always coincide in opinion with her, but I always respect her. The very word respect brings Mrs. Macaulay to my remembrance. The woman of the greatest abilities, undoubtedly, that this country has ever produced. And yet, this woman has been suffered to die without sufficient respect being paid to her memory. Posterity, however, will be more just. And remember that Catherine Macaulay was an example of intellectual acquirements supposed to be incompatible with the weakness of her sex. In her style of writing, indeed, no sex appears, for it is like the sense it conveys, strong and clear. I will not call hers a masculine understanding, because I admit not of such an arrogant assumption of reason. But I contend that it was a sound one, and that her judgment, the matured fruit of profound thinking, was a proof that a woman can acquire judgment in the full extent of the word. Possessing more penetration than sagacity, more understanding than fancy, she writes with sober energy and argumentative closeness. Yet sympathy and benevolence give an interest to her sentiments, and that vital heat to arguments which forces the reader to weigh them. When I first thought of writing these strictures, I anticipated Mrs. Macaulay's approbation with a little of that sanguine ardour which it has been the business of my life to depress, but soon heard with the sickly qualm of disappointed hope and the still seriousness of regret that she was no more. Section 5.5 .5. Taking a view of the different works which have been written on education, Lord Chesterfield's letters must not be silently passed over. Not that I mean to analyse his unmanly, immoral system, or even to cull any of the useful, shrewd remarks which occur in his frivolous correspondence. No, I only mean to make a few reflections on the avowed tendency of them, the art of acquiring an early knowledge of the world. An art, I will venture to assert, that preys secretly, like the worm in the bud, on the expanding powers, and turns to poison the generous juices which should mount with vigour in the youthful frame, inspiring warm affections and great resolves. For everything, saith the wise man, there is reason, 
and who would look for the fruits of autumn during the genial months of spring? But this is mere declamation, and I mean to reason with those worldly wise instructors, who instead of cultivating the judgment, instill prejudices and render hard the heart that gradual experience would only have cooled. An early acquaintance with human infirmities, or what is termed knowledge of the world, is the surest way, in my opinion, to contract the heart and damp the natural youthful ardour which produces not only great talents but great virtues. For the vain attempt to bring forth the fruit of experience before the sapling has thrown out its leaves only exhausts its strength and prevents its assuming a natural form, just as the form and strength of subsiding metals are injured when the attraction of cohesion is disturbed. Tell me, ye who have studied the human mind, is it not a strange way to fix principles by showing young people that they are seldom stable? And how can they be fortified by habits when they are proved to be fallacious by example? Why is the ardour of youth thus to be damped and the luxuriancy of fancy cut to the quick? This dry caution may, it is true, guard a character from worldly mischances, but will infallibly preclude excellence in either virtue or knowledge. The stumbling block thrown across every path by suspicion will prevent any vigorous exertions of genius or benevolence, and life will be stripped of its most alluring charm long before its calm evening, when man should retire to contemplation for comfort and support. A young man who has been bred up with domestic friends and led to store his mind with as much speculative knowledge as can be acquired by reading and the natural reflections which youthful ebullitions of animal spirits and instinctive feelings inspire, will enter the world with warm and erroneous expectations. But this appears to be the course of nature, and in morals as well as in works of taste we should be observant of her sacred indications, and not presume to lead when we ought obsequiously to follow. In the world, few people act from principle. Present feelings and early habits are the grand springs. But how would the former be deadened and the latter rendered iron-corroding fetters if the world were shown to young people just as it is? when no knowledge of mankind or their own hearts, slowly obtained by experience, rendered them forbearing. Their fellow creatures would not then be viewed as frail beings, like themselves condemned to struggle with human infirmities, and sometimes displaying the light and sometimes the dark side of their character extorting alternate feelings of love and disgust, but guarded against as beasts of prey, till every enlarged social feeling, in a word, humanity, was eradicated. In life, on the contrary, as we gradually discover the imperfections of our nature, we discover virtues, and various circumstances attach us to our fellow creatures when we mix with them and view the same objects that are never thought of in acquiring a hasty, unnatural knowledge of the world. We see a folly swell into a vice by almost imperceptible degrees and pity while we blame. But if the hideous monster burst suddenly on our sight, 
fear and disgust rendering us more severe than man ought to be might lead us with blind zeal to usurp the character of omnipotence and denounce damnation on our fellow mortals forgetting that we cannot read the heart and that we have seeds of the same vices lurking in our own i have already remarked that we expect more from instruction than mere instruction can produce for instead of preparing young people to encounter the evils of life with dignity and to acquire wisdom and virtue by the exercise of their own faculties precepts are heaped upon precepts and blind obedience required when conviction should be brought home to reason suppose for instance that a young person in the first ardour of friendship deifies the beloved object what harm can arise from this mistaken enthusiastic attachment perhaps it is necessary for virtue first to appear in a human form to impress youthful hearts the ideal model which a more matured and exalted mind looks up to and shapes for itself would elude their sight he who loves not his brother whom he hath seen how can he love god ask the wisest of men it is natural for youth to adorn the first object of its affection with every good quality and the emulation produced by ignorance or to speak with more propriety by inexperience brings forward the mind capable of forming such an affection and when in the lapse of time perfection is found not to be within the reach of mortals virtue abstractly is thought beautiful and wisdom sublime admiration then gives place to friendship properly so called because it is cemented by esteem and the being walks alone only dependent on heaven for that emulous panting after perfection which ever glows in a noble mind but this knowledge a man must gain by the exertion of his own faculties and this is surely the blessed fruit of disappointed hope for he who delighteth to diffuse happiness and show mercy to the weak creatures who are learning to know him never implanted a good propensity to be a tormenting ignus fatuus our trees are now allowed to spread with wild luxuriance nor do we expect by force to combine the majestic marks of time with youthful graces but wait patiently till they have struck deep their root and braved many a storm is the mind then which in proportion to its dignity advances more slowly towards perfection to be treated with less respect to argue from analogy everything around us is in a progressive state and when an unwelcome knowledge of life produces almost a satiety of life and we discover by the natural course of things that all that is done under the sun is vanity we are drawing near the awful close of the drama the days of activity and hope are over and the opportunities which the first stage of existence has afforded of advancing in the scale of intelligence must soon be summed up a knowledge at this period of the futility of life or earlier if obtained by experience is very useful because it is natural but when a frail being is shown the follies and vices of man 
that he may be taught prudently to guard against the common casualties of life by sacrificing his heart. Surely it is not speaking harshly to call it the wisdom of this world, contrasted with the nobler fruit of piety and experience. I will venture a paradox and deliver my opinion without reserve. If men were only born to form a circle of life and death, it would be wise to take every step that foresight could suggest to render life happy. Moderation in every pursuit would then be supreme wisdom, and the prudent voluptuary might enjoy a degree of content, though he neither cultivated his understanding nor kept his heart pure. Prudence, supposing we were mortal, would be true wisdom, or, to be more explicit, would procure the greatest portion of happiness, considering the whole of life. But knowledge beyond the conveniences of life would be a curse. Why should we injure our health by close study? The exalted pleasure which intellectual pursuits afford would scarcely be equivalent to the hours of languor that follow, especially if it be necessary to take into the reckoning the doubts and disappointments that cloud our researches. Vanity and vexation close every inquiry, for the cause which we particularly wished to discover flies like the horizon before us as we advance. The ignorant, on the contrary, resemble children, and suppose that if they could walk straight forward, they should at last arrive where the earth and clouds meet. Yet, disappointed as we are in our researches, the mind gains strength by the exercise, sufficient, perhaps, to comprehend the answers which, in another step of existence, it may receive to the anxious questions it asked, when the understanding with feeble wing was fluttering round the visible effects to dive into the hidden cause. The passions also, the winds of life, would be useless, if not injurious, did the substance which composes our thinking being, after we have thought in vain, only become the support of vegetable life, and invigorate a cabbage or blush in a rose. The appetites would answer every earthly purpose, and produce more moderate and permanent happiness. But the powers of the soul that are of little use here, and probably disturb our animal enjoyments, even while conscious dignity makes us glory in possessing them, prove that life is merely an education, a state of infancy, of which the only hopes worth cherishing should not be sacrificed. I mean, therefore, to infer that we ought to have a precise idea of what we wish to attain by education, for the immortality of the soul is contradicted by the actions of many people who firmly profess the belief. If you mean to secure ease and prosperity on earth as the first consideration, and leave futurity to provide for itself, you act prudently in giving your child an early insight into the weaknesses of his nature. You may not, it is true, make an inkle of him, but do not imagine that he will stick to more than the letter of the law, who has very early imbibed a mean opinion of human nature. Nor will he think it necessary to rise much above the common standard. He may avoid gross vices, because honesty is the best policy, but he will never aim at attaining great virtues. The example of writers and artists 
will illustrate this remark. I must therefore venture to doubt whether what has been thought an axiom in morals may not have been a dogmatical assertion made by men who have coolly seen mankind through the medium of books and say in direct contradiction to them that the regulation of the passions is not always wisdom. On the contrary, it should seem that one reason why men have superior judgment and more fortitude than women is undoubtedly this, that they give a freer scope to the grand passions and by more frequently going astray enlarge their minds. If then by the exercise of their own reason they fix on some stable principle, they have probably to thank the force of their passions, nourished by false views of life and permitted to overleap the boundary that secures content. But if in the dawn of life we could soberly survey the scenes before us as in perspective and see everything in its true colours, how could the passions gain sufficient strength to unfold the faculties? Let me now, as from an eminence, survey the world stripped of all its false delusive charms. The clear atmosphere enables me to see each object in its true point of view while my heart is still. I am calm as the prospect in a morning when the mists slowly dispersing silently unveil the beauties of nature refreshed by rest. In what light will the world now appear? I rub my eyes and think, perchance, that I am just awaking from a lively dream. I see the sons and daughters of men pursuing shadows and anxiously wasting their powers to feed passions which have no adequate object. If the very excess of these blind impulses, pampered by that lying yet constantly trusted guide, the imagination, did not by preparing them for some other state render short-sighted mortals wiser without their own concurrence. Or, what comes to the same thing, when they were pursuing some imaginary present good, after viewing objects in this light, it would not be very fanciful to imagine that this world was a stage on which a pantomime is daily performed for the amusement of superior beings. How would they be diverted to see the ambitious man consuming himself by running after a phantom and pursuing the bubble fame in the cannon's mouth that was to blow him to nothing? For when consciousness is lost, it matters not whether we mount in a whirlwind or descend in rain. And should they compassionately invigorate his sight and show him the thorny path which led to eminence that like a quicksand sinks as he ascends, disappointing his hopes when almost within his grasp, would he not leave to others the honour of amusing them and labour to secure the present moment, though from the constitution of his nature he would not find it very easy to catch the flying stream. Such slaves are we to hope and fear. But vain as the ambitious man's pursuit would be, he is often striving for something more substantial than fame. That indeed would be the veriest meteor, the wildest fire, that could lure a man to ruin. What? Renounce the most trifling gratification to be applauded when he should be no more? Wherefore this struggle, whether man is mortal or immortal, if that noble passion did not really raise the being above his fellows? 
and love. What diverting scenes would it produce? Pantaloon's tricks must yield to more egregious folly. To see a mortal adorn an object with imaginary charms and then fall down and worship the idol which he had himself set up. How ridiculous! But what serious consequences ensue to rob man of that portion of happiness which the deity, by calling him into existence, has, or on what can his attributes rest, indubitably promised? Would not all the purposes of life have been much better fulfilled if he had only felt what has been termed physical love? And would not the sight of the object not seen through the medium of the imagination, soon reduce the passion to an appetite. If reflection, the noble distinction of man, did not give it force and make it an instrument to raise him above this earthy dross, by teaching him to love the centre of all perfection, whose wisdom appears clearer and clearer in the works of nature, in proportion as reason is illuminated and exalted by contemplation, and by acquiring that love of order which the struggles of passion produce. The habit of reflection and the knowledge attained by fostering any passion might be shown to be equally useful, though the object be proved equally fallacious. For they would all appear in the same light if they were not magnified by the governing passion implanted in us by the author of all good, to call forth and strengthen the faculties of each individual and enable it to attain all the experience that an infant can obtain, who does certain things it cannot tell why. I descend from my height, and mixing with my fellow creatures feel myself hurried along the common stream. Ambition, love, hope, and fear exert their wonted power, though we be convinced by reason that their present and most attractive promises are only lying dreams. But had the cold hand of circumspection damped each generous feeling before it had left any permanent character or fixed some habit, what could be expected but selfish prudence and reason just rising above instinct? Who that has read Dean Swift's disgusting description of the yahoos and insipid one of Hwinanim with a philosophical eye, can avoid seeing the futility of degrading the passions or making man rest in contentment. The youth should act, for had he the experience of a grey head, he would be fitter for death than life, though his virtues rather residing in his head than his heart, could produce nothing great, and his understanding prepared for this world would not, by its noble flights, prove that it had a title to a better. Besides, it is not possible to give a young person a just view of life. He must have struggled with his own passions, before he can estimate the force of the temptation which betrayed his brother into vice. Those who are entering life and those who are departing see the world from such very different points of view that they can seldom think alike unless the unfledged reason of the former never attempted a solitary flight. When we hear of some daring crime, it comes full upon us in the deepest shade of turpitude and raises indignation. But the eye that gradually saw the darkness thicken must observe it with more compassionate forbearance. 
The world cannot be seen by an unmoved spectator. We must mix in the throng and feel as men feel before we can judge of their feelings. If we mean, in short, to live in the world, to grow wiser and better, and not merely to enjoy the good things of life, we must attain a knowledge of others at the same time that we become acquainted with ourselves. Knowledge acquired any other way only hardens the heart and perplexes the understanding. I may be told that the knowledge thus acquired is sometimes purchased at too dear a rate. I can only answer that I very much doubt whether any knowledge can be attained without labour and sorrow, and those who wish to spare their children both should not complain if they are neither wise nor virtuous. They only aimed at making them prudent, and prudence early in life is but the cautious craft of ignorant self-love. I have observed that young people to whose education particular attention has been paid have, in general, been very superficial and conceited and far from pleasing in any respect, because they had neither the unsuspecting warmth of youth nor the cool depth of age. I cannot help imputing this unnatural appearance principally to that hasty, premature instruction which leads them presumptuously to repeat all the crude notions they have taken upon trust, so that the careful education which they received makes them all their lives the slaves of prejudices. Mental as well as bodily exertion is at first irksome, so much so that the many would fain let others both work and think for them. An observation which I have often made will illustrate my meaning. When in a circle of strangers or acquaintances a person of moderate abilities asserts an opinion with heat, I will venture to affirm, for I have traced this fact home very often, that it is a prejudice. These echoes have a high respect for the understanding of some relation or friend, and without fully comprehending the opinions which they are so eager to retail, they maintain them with a degree of obstinacy that would surprise even the person who concocted them. I know that a kind of fashion now prevails of respecting prejudices, and when any one dares to face them, though actuated by humanity and armed by reason, he is superciliously asked whether his ancestors were fools. No, I should reply, opinions at first of every description were all probably considered and therefore were founded on some reason. Yet not unfrequently, of course, it was rather a local expedient than a fundamental principle that would be reasonable at all times. But moss-covered opinions assume the disproportioned form of prejudices when they are indolently adopted only because age has given them a venerable aspect, though the reason on which they were built ceases to be a reason or cannot be traced. Why are we to love prejudices merely because they are prejudices? A prejudice is a fond, obstinate persuasion for which we can give no reason. For the moment a reason can be given for an opinion, it ceases to be a prejudice, though it may be an error in judgment. And are we then advised to cherish opinions only to set reason at defiance? This mode of arguing, if 
arguing it may be called, reminds me of what is vulgarly termed a woman's reason. For women sometimes declare that they love or believe certain things because they love or believe them. It is impossible to converse with people to any purpose who in this style only use affirmatives and negatives. Before you can bring them to a point to start fairly from, you must go back to the simple principles that were antecedent to the prejudices broached by power. And it is ten to one, but you are stopped by the philosophical assertion that certain principles are as practically false as they are abstractly true. Nay, it may be inferred that reason has whispered some doubts, for it generally happens that people assert their opinions with the greatest heat when they begin to waver. Striving to drive out their own doubts by convincing their opponent, they grow angry when those gnawing doubts are thrown back to prey on themselves. The fact is that men expect from education what education cannot give. A sagacious parent or tutor may strengthen the body and sharpen the instruments by which the child is to gather knowledge, but the honey must be the reward of the individual's own industry. It is almost as absurd to attempt to make a youth wise by the experience of another as to expect the body to grow strong by the exercise which is only talked of or seen. Many of those children whose conduct has been most narrowly watched become the weakest men, because their instructors only instil certain notions into their minds that have no other foundation than their authority. And if they are loved or respected, the mind is cramped in its exertions and wavering in its advances. The business of education in this case is only to conduct the shooting tendrils to a proper pole. Yet, after laying precept upon precept, without allowing a child to acquire judgment itself, parents expect them to act in the same manner by this borrowed, fallacious light as if they had illuminated it themselves, and be, when they enter life, what their parents are at the close. They do not consider that the tree and even the human body does not strengthen its fibres till it has reached its full growth. There appears to be something analogous in the mind. The senses and the imagination give a form to the character during childhood and youth, and the understanding, as life advances, gives firmness to the first fair purposes of sensibility, till virtue, arising rather from the clear conviction of reason than the impulse of the heart, morality is made to rest on a rock against which the storms of passion vainly beat. I hope I shall not be misunderstood when I say that religion will not have this condensing energy unless it be founded on reason. If it be merely the refuge of weakness or wild fanaticism, and not a governing principle of conduct drawn from self-knowledge and a rational opinion respecting the attributes of God, what can it be expected to produce? The religion which consists in warming the affections and exalting the imagination is only the poetical part, and may afford the individual pleasure without rendering it a more moral being. It may be a substitute for worldly pursuits, yet narrow instead of enlarging the heart. But virtue must be loved as in itself sublime and excellent, 
and not for the advantages it procures or the evils it averts, if any great degree of excellence be expected. Men will not become moral when they only build airy castles in a future world to compensate for the disappointments which they meet with in this. If they turn their thoughts from relative duties to religious reveries. Most prospects in life are marred by the shuffling worldly wisdom of men who, forgetting that they cannot serve God and mammon, endeavour to blend contradictory things. If you wish to make your son rich, pursue one course. If you are only anxious to make him virtuous, you must take another. But do not imagine that you can bound from one road to the other without losing your way. Chapter 6 The effect which an early association of ideas has upon the character, educated in the enervating style recommended by the writers on whom I have been animadverting, and not having a chance from their subordinate state in society to recover their lost ground, is it surprising that women everywhere appear a defect in nature? Is it surprising when we consider what a determinate effect an early association of ideas has on the character that they neglect their understandings and turn all their attention to their persons. The great advantages which naturally result from storing the mind with knowledge are obvious from the following considerations. The association of our ideas is either habitual or instantaneous, and the latter mode seems rather to depend on the original temperature of the mind than on the will. When the ideas and matters of fact are once taken in, they lie by for use till some fortuitous circumstance makes the information dart into the mind with illustrative force that has been received at very different periods of our lives. Like the lightning's flash are many recollections, one idea assimilating and explaining another with astonishing rapidity. I do not now allude to that quick perception of truth, which is so intuitive that it baffles research and makes us at a loss to determine whether it is reminiscence or ratiocination, lost sight of in its celerity that opens the dark cloud. Over those instantaneous associations we have little power, for when the mind is once enlarged by excursive flights or profound reflection, the raw materials will, in some degree, arrange themselves. The understanding, it is true, may keep us from going out of drawing when we group our thoughts or transcribe from the imagination the warm sketches of fancy. But the animal spirits, the individual character, give the colouring. Over this subtle electric fluid, how little power do we possess, and over it how little power can reason obtain. These fine, intractable spirits appear to be the essence of genius, and beaming in its eagle eye, produce in the most eminent degree the happy energy of associating thoughts that surprise, delight, and instruct. These are the glowing minds that concentrate pictures for their fellow creatures, forcing them to view with interest the objects reflected from the impassioned imagination which they passed over in nature. I must be allowed to explain myself. The generality of people cannot see or feel poetically. They want fancy, 
and therefore fly from solitude in search of sensible objects. But when an author lends them his eyes, they can see as he saw and be amused by images they could not select, though lying before them. Education thus only supplies the man of genius with knowledge to give variety and contrast to his associations. But there is an habitual association of ideas that grows with our growth, which has a great effect on the moral character of mankind, and by which a turn is given to the mind that commonly remains throughout life. So ductile is the understanding, and yet so stubborn, that the associations which depend on adventitious circumstances during the period that the body takes to arrive at maturity can seldom be disentangled by reason. One idea calls up another its old associate, and memory faithful to the first impressions, particularly when the intellectual powers are not employed to cool our sensations, retraces them with mechanical exactness. This habitual slavery to first impressions has a more baneful effect on the female than the male character, because business and other dry employments of the understanding tend to deaden the feelings and break associations that do violence to reason. But females, who are made women of when they are mere children and brought back to childhood when they ought to leave the go-cart forever, have not sufficient strength of mind to efface the super-inductions of art that have smothered nature. Everything that they see or hear serves to fix impressions, call forth emotions, and associate ideas that give a sexual character to the mind. False notions of beauty and delicacy stop the growth of their limbs and produce a sickly soreness rather than delicacy of organs. And thus, weakened by being employed in unfolding instead of examining the first associations forced on them by every surrounding object, how can they attain the vigour necessary to enable them to throw off their factitious character? Where? find strength to recur to reason and rise superior to a system of oppression that blasts the fair promises of spring. This cruel association of ideas, which everything conspires to twist into all their habits of thinking, or, to speak with more precision, of feeling, receives new force when they begin to act a little for themselves. For they then perceive that it is only through their address to excite emotions in men that pleasure and power are to be obtained. Besides, all the books professedly written for their instruction, which make the first impression on their minds, all inculcate the same opinions. Educated in worse than Egyptian bondage, it is unreasonable, as well as cruel, to upbraid them with faults that can scarcely be avoided, unless a degree of native vigour be supposed, that falls to the lot of very few amongst mankind. For instance, the severest sarcasms have been levelled against the sex, and they have been ridiculed for repeating a set of phrases learnt by rote, when nothing could be more natural, considering the education they receive, and that their highest praise is to obey, unargued, the will of man. If they are not allowed to have reason sufficient to govern their own conduct, why, all they learn must be learned by rote. 
and when all their ingenuity is called forth to adjust their dress, a passion for a scarlet coat is so natural that it never surprised me. And allowing Pope's summary of their character to be just, that every woman is at heart a rake, why should they be bitterly censured for seeking a congenial mind and preferring a rake? to a man of sense. Rakes know how to work on their sensibility, whilst the modest merit of reasonable men has, of course, less effect on their feelings, and they cannot reach the heart by the way of the understanding, because they have few sentiments in common. It seems a little absurd to expect women to be more reasonable than men in their likings, and still to deny them the uncontrolled use of reason. When do men fall in love with sense? When do they, with their superior powers and advantages, turn from the person to the mind? And how can they then expect women, who are only taught to observe behaviour and acquire manners rather than morals, to despise what they have been all their lives labouring to attain. Where are they suddenly to find judgment enough to weigh patiently the sense of an awkward, virtuous man, when his manners, of which they are made critical judges, are rebuffing and his conversation cold and dull, because it does not consist of pretty repartees or well-turned compliments. In order to admire or esteem anything for a continuance, we must at least have our curiosity excited by knowing in some degree what we admire. For we are unable to estimate the value of qualities and virtues above our comprehension. Such a respect, when it is felt, may be very sublime, and the confused consciousness of humility may render the dependent creature an interesting object in some points of view. But human love must have grosser ingredients, and the person very naturally will come in for its share, and an ample share it mostly has. Love is in a great degree an arbitrary passion, and will reign like some other stalking mischiefs by its own authority, without deigning to reason. And it may also be easily distinguished from esteem, the foundation of friendship, because it is often excited by evanescent beauties and graces, though to give an energy to the sentiment something more solid must deepen their impression and set the imagination to work, to make the most fair the first good. Common passions are excited by common qualities. Men look for beauty and the simper of good-humoured docility. Women are captivated by easy manners, a gentleman-like man seldom fails to please them, and their thirsty ears eagerly drink the insinuating nothings of politeness, whilst they turn from the unintelligible sounds of the charmer reason, charm he never so wisely. With respect to superficial accomplishments, the rake certainly has the advantage, and of these Females can form an opinion, for it is their own ground. Rendered gay and giddy by the whole tenor of their lives, the very aspect of wisdom or the severe graces of virtue must have a lugubrious appearance to them and produce a kind of restraint from which they and love, sportive child, naturally revolt. Without taste excepting of the lighter kind, for taste is the offspring of judgment. How can they discover that 
true beauty and grace must arise from the play of the mind, and how can they be expected to relish in a lover what they do not or very imperfectly possess themselves? The sympathy that unites hearts and invites to confidence in them is so very faint that it cannot take fire and thus mount to passion. No, I repeat it, the love cherished by such minds must have grosser fuel. The inference is obvious. Till women are led to exercise their understandings, they should not be satirized for their attachment to rakes, nor even for being rakes at heart when it appears to be the inevitable consequence of their education. They who live to please must find their enjoyments, their happiness, in pleasure. It is a trite yet true remark that we never do anything well unless we love it for its own sake. Supposing, however, for a moment, that women were, in some future revolution of time, to become what I sincerely wish them to be, even love would acquire more serious dignity and be purified in its own fires, and virtue giving true delicacy to their affections, they would turn with disgust from a rake. Reasoning, then, as well as feeling the only province of woman at present, they might easily guard against exterior graces and quickly learn to despise the sensibility that had been excited and hackneyed in the ways of women whose trade was vice and allurements wanton airs. They would recollect that the flame, one must use appropriate expressions, which they wished to light up, had been exhausted by lust, and that the sated appetite, losing all relish for pure and simple pleasures, could only be roused by licentious arts of variety. What satisfaction could a woman of delicacy promise herself in a union with such a man, when the very artlessness of her affection might appear insipid? Thus does Dryden describe the situation. Where love is duty on the female side, on theirs mere sensual gust and sought with surly pride. But one grand truth women have yet to learn, though much it imports them to act accordingly. In the choice of a husband, they should not be led astray by the qualities of a lover. For a lover, the husband, even supposing him to be wise and virtuous, cannot long remain. Were women more rationally educated, could they take a more comprehensive view of things, they would be contented to love but once in their lives. And after marriage, calmly let passion subside into friendship, into that tender intimacy which is the best refuge from care, yet is built on such pure, still affections that idle jealousies would not be allowed to disturb the discharge of the sober duties of life, nor to engross the thoughts that ought to be otherwise employed. This is a state in which many men live, but few, very few women, and the difference may easily be accounted for without recurring to a sexual character. Men, for whom we are told women are made, have too much occupied the thoughts of women, and this association has so entangled love with all their motives of action and to harp a little on an old string, having been solely employed either to prepare themselves to excite love or actually putting their lessons in practice, they cannot live without love. 
but when a sense of duty or fear of shame obliges them to restrain this pampered desire of pleasing beyond certain lengths. Too far for delicacy, it is true, though far from criminality, they obstinately determine to love. I speak of their passion, their husbands, to the end of the chapter, and then acting the part which they foolishly exacted from their lovers. They become abject wooers and fond slaves. Men of wit and fancy are often rakes, and fancy is the food of love. Such men will inspire passion. Half the sex, in its present infantine state, would pine for a lovelace, a man so witty, so graceful, and so valiant. And can they deserve blame for acting according to principles so constantly inculcated? They want a lover and protector, and behold him kneeling before them, bravery prostrate to beauty. The virtues of a husband are thus thrown by love into the background, and gay hopes or lively emotions banish reflection till the day of reckoning comes. And come it surely will, to turn the sprightly lover into a surly, suspicious tyrant, who contemptuously insults the very weakness he fostered. Or, supposing the rake reformed, he cannot quickly get rid of old habits. When a man of abilities is first carried away by his passions, it is necessary that sentiment and taste varnish the enormities of vice and give a zest to brutal indulgences. But when the gloss of novelty is worn off and pleasure palls upon the sense, lasciviousness becomes barefaced and enjoyment only the desperate effort of weakness flying from reflection as from a legion of devils. O oh, virtue, thou art not an empty name. All that life can give, thou givest. If much comfort cannot be expected from the friendship of a reformed rake of superior abilities, what is the consequence when he lacketh sense as well as principles? Verily misery in its most hideous shape. When the habits of weak people are consolidated by time, a reformation is barely possible, and actually makes the beings miserable who have not sufficient mind to be amused by innocent pleasure. Like the tradesman who retires from the hurry of business, nature presents to them only a universal blank, and the restless thoughts prey on the damped spirits. Their reformation, as well as his retirement, actually makes them wretched, because it deprives them of all employment by quenching the hopes and fears that set in motion their sluggish minds. If such be the force of habit, if such be the bondage of folly, how carefully ought we to guard the mind from storing up vicious associations, and equally careful should we be to cultivate the understanding, to save the poor white from the weak dependent state of even harmless ignorance. For it is the right use of reason alone which makes us independent of everything, excepting the unclouded reason, whose service is perfect freedom. Chapter 7 Modesty comprehensively considered, and not as a sexual virtue. Modesty, sacred offspring of sensibility and reason, true delicacy of mind. May I, unblamed, presume to investigate thy nature, 
and trace to its covert the mild charm that mellowing each harsh feature of a character renders what would otherwise only inspire cold admiration lovely. Thou that smoothest the wrinkles of wisdom and softenest the tone of the more sublime virtues till they all melt into humanity. Thou that spreadest the ethereal cloud that surrounding love heightens every beauty it half shades, breathing those coy sweets that steal into the heart and charm the senses. Modulate for me the language of persuasive reason, till I rouse my sex from the flowery bed on which they supinely sleep life away. In speaking of the association of our ideas, I have noticed two distinct modes. And in defining modesty, it appears to me equally proper to discriminate that purity of mind which is the effect of chastity from a simplicity of character that leads us to form a just opinion of ourselves, equally distant from vanity or presumption, though by no means incompatible with a lofty consciousness of our own dignity. Modesty in the latter signification of the term is that soberness of mind which teaches a man not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, and should be distinguished from humility, because humility is a kind of self-abasement. A modest man often conceives a great plan and tenaciously adheres to it, conscious of his own strength till success gives it a sanction that determines its character. Milton was not arrogant when he suffered a suggestion of judgment to escape him that proved a prophecy. Nor was General Washington when he accepted of the command of the American forces. The latter has always been characterized as a modest man. But had he been merely humble, he would probably have shrunk back irresolute, afraid of trusting to himself the direction of an enterprise on which so much depended. A modest man is steady, an humble man timid, and a vain one presumptuous. This is the judgment which the observation of many characters has led me to form. Jesus Christ was modest, Moses was humble, and Peter vain. Thus discriminating modesty from humility in one case, I do not mean to confound it with bashfulness in the other. Bashfulness, in fact, is so distinct from modesty that the most bashful lass or raw country lout often becomes the most impudent, for their bashfulness being merely the instinctive timidity of ignorance, custom soon changes it into assurance. The shameless behaviour of the prostitutes who infest the streets of London, raising alternate emotions of pity and disgust may serve to illustrate this remark. They trample on virgin bashfulness with a sort of bravado, and, glorying in their shame, become more audaciously lewd than men, however depraved, to whom the sexual quality has not been gratuitously granted, ever appear to be. But these poor, ignorant wretches never had any modesty to lose when they consigned themselves to infamy, for modesty is a virtue, not a quality. No, they were only bashful, shamefaced innocence, and losing their innocence, their shamefacedness, 
was rudely brushed off. A virtue would have left some vestiges in the mind, had it been sacrificed to passion, to make us respect the grand ruin. Purity of mind, or that genuine delicacy, which is the only virtuous support of chastity, is near akin to that refinement of humanity which never resides in any but cultivated minds. It is something nobler than innocence. It is the delicacy of reflection and not the coyness of ignorance. The reserve of reason, which like habitual cleanliness, is seldom seen in any great degree unless the soul is active, may easily be distinguished from rustic shyness or wanton skittishness. And so far from being incompatible with knowledge, it is its fairest fruit. What a gross idea of modesty had the writer of the following remark. The lady who asked the question whether women may be instructed in the modern system of botany consistently with female delicacy was accused of ridiculous prudery. Nevertheless, if she had proposed the question to me, I should certainly have answered, they cannot. Thus is the fair book of knowledge to be shut with an everlasting seal. On reading similar passages, I have reverentially lifted up my eyes and heart to him who liveth for ever and ever, and said, O oh, my father, hast thou, by the very constitution of her nature, forbid thy child to seek thee in the fair forms of truth? And can her soul be sullied by the knowledge that awfully calls her to thee. I have then philosophically pursued these reflections till I inferred that those women who have most improved their reason must have the most modesty, though a dignified sedateness of deportment may have succeeded the playful, bewitching bashfulness of youth. And thus have I argued. To render chastity the virtue from which unsophisticated modesty will naturally flow, the attention should be called away from employments which only exercise the sensibility, and the heart made to beat time to humanity rather than to throb with love. The woman who has dedicated a considerable portion of her time to pursuits purely intellectual, and whose affections have been exercised by humane plans of usefulness, must have more purity of mind as a natural consequence than the ignorant beings whose time and thoughts have been occupied by gay pleasures or schemes to conquer hearts. The regulation of the behaviour is not modesty, though those who study rules of decorum are in general termed modest women. Make the heart clean, let it expand, and feel for all that is human, instead of being narrowed by selfish passions and let the mind frequently contemplate subjects that exercise the understanding without heating the imagination, and artless modesty will give the finishing touches to the picture. She who can discern the dawn of immortality in the streaks that shoot athwart the misty night of ignorance, promising a clearer day, will respect as a sacred temple the body that enshrines such an improvable soul. True love, likewise, spreads this kind of mysterious sanctity round the beloved object, making the lover most modest 
when in her presence. So reserved is affection that, receiving or returning personal endearments, it wishes not only to shun the human eye as a kind of profanation, but to diffuse an encircling cloudy obscurity to shut out even the saucy sparkling sunbeams. Yet that affection does not deserve the epithet of chaste, which does not receive a sublime gloom of tender melancholy that allows the mind for a moment to stand still and enjoy the present satisfaction when a consciousness of the divine presence is felt. For this must ever be the food of joy. As I have always been fond of tracing to its source in nature any prevailing custom, I have frequently thought that it was a sentiment of affection for whatever had touched the person of an absent or lost friend, which gave birth to that respect for relics so much abused by selfish priests. Devotion or love may be allowed to hallow the garments as well as the person, for the lover must want fancy, who has not a sort of sacred respect for the glove or slipper of his mistress. He could not confound them with vulgar things of the same kind. This fine sentiment, perhaps, would not bear to be analysed by the experimental philosopher, but of such stuff is human rapture made up. A shadowy phantom glides before us, obscuring every other object. Yet when the soft cloud is grasped, the form melts into common air, leaving a solitary void or sweet perfume stolen from the violet that memory long holds dear. But I have tripped unawares on fairy ground, feeling the balmy gale of spring stealing on me, though November frowns. As a sex, women are more chaste than men, and as modesty is the effect of chastity, they may deserve to have this virtue ascribed to them in rather an appropriated sense. Yet, I must be allowed to add an hesitating if, for I doubt whether chastity will produce modesty, though it may propriety of conduct, when it is merely a respect for the opinion of the world, and when coquetry and the lovelorn tales of novelists employ the thoughts. Nay, from experience and reason, I should be led to expect to meet with more modesty amongst men than women, simply because men exercise their understandings more than women. But with respect to propriety of behaviour, excepting one class of females, women have evidently the advantage. What can be more disgusting than that impudent dross of gallantry thought so manly, which makes many men stare insultingly at every female they meet. Is this respect for the sex? This loose behaviour shows such habitual depravity, such weakness of mind, that it is vain to expect much public or private virtue till both men and women grow more modest, till men curbing a sensual fondness for the sex or an affectation of manly assurance, more properly speaking impudence, treat each other with respect, unless appetite or passion gives the tone peculiar to it to their behaviour. I mean even personal respect, the modest respect of humanity and fellow-feeling, 
not the libidinous mockery of gallantry, nor the insolent condescension of protectorship. To carry the observation still further, modesty must heartily disclaim and refuse to dwell with that debauchery of mind which leads a man coolly to bring forward without a blush indecent allusions or obscene witticisms in the presence of a fellow creature. Women are now out of the question, for then it is brutality. Respect for man as man is the foundation of every noble sentiment. How much more modest is the libertine who obeys the call of appetite or fancy than the lewd joker who sets the table in a roar? This is one of the many instances in which the sexual distinction respecting modesty has proved fatal to virtue and happiness. It is, however, carried still further, and woman, weak woman, made by her education the slave of sensibility, is required on the most trying occasions to resist that sensibility. Can anything, says Knox, be more absurd than keeping women in a state of ignorance, and yet so vehemently to insist on their resisting temptation. Thus, when virtue or honour make it proper to check a passion, the burden is thrown on the weaker shoulders, contrary to reason and true modesty, which at least should render the self-denial mutual, to say nothing of the generosity of bravery supposed to be a manly virtue. In the same strain runs Rousseau's and Dr. Gregory's advice respecting modesty, strangely miscalled. For they both desire a wife, to leave it in doubt whether sensibility or weakness led her to her husband's arms. The woman is immodest, who can let the shadow of such a doubt remain on her husband's mind a moment. But to state the subject in a different light, the want of modesty, which I principally deplore as subversive of morality, arises from the state of warfare so strenuously supported by voluptuous men as the very essence of modesty, though in fact its bane, because it is a refinement on sensual desire that men fall into who have not sufficient virtue to relish the innocent pleasures of love. A man of delicacy carries his notions of modesty still further, for neither weakness nor sensibility will gratify him. He looks for affection. Again, men boast of their triumphs over women. What do they boast of? Truly, the creature of sensibility was surprised by her sensibility into folly, into vice, and the dreadful reckoning falls heavily on her own weak head when reason wakes. For where art thou to find comfort, forlorn and disconsolate one? He who ought to have directed thy reason and supported thy weakness has betrayed thee. In a dream of passion thou consentedst to wander through flowery lawns, and heedlessly stepping over the precipice to which thy guide, instead of guarding, lured thee, thou startest from thy dream only to face a sneering, frowning world, and to find thyself alone in a waste, for he that triumphed in thy weakness is now pursuing new conquests. But for thee there is no redemption on this side the grave. And what resource hast thou in an enervated mind 
to raise a sinking heart. But if the sexes be really to live in a state of warfare, if nature has pointed it out, let men act nobly, or let pride whisper to them that the victory is mean when they merely vanquish sensibility. The real conquest is that over affection not taken by surprise, when, like Heloisa, a woman gives up all the world deliberately for love. I do not now consider the wisdom or virtue of such a sacrifice. I only contend that it was a sacrifice to affection, and not merely to sensibility, though she had her share. And I must be allowed to call her a modest woman before I dismiss this part of the subject by saying that till men are more chaste, women will be immodest. Where indeed could modest women find husbands from whom they would not continually turn with disgust? Modesty must be equally cultivated by both sexes, or it will ever remain a sickly hothouse plant, whilst the affectation of it, the fig leaf borrowed by wantonness, may give a zest to voluptuous enjoyments. Men will probably still insist that woman ought to have more modesty than man, but it is not dispassionate reasoners who will most earnestly oppose my opinion. No, they are the men of fancy, the favourites of the sex, who outwardly respect and inwardly despise the weak creatures whom they thus sport with. They cannot submit to resign the highest sensual gratification, nor even to relish the epicurism of virtue, self-denial. To take another view of the subject, confining my remarks to women, the ridiculous falsities which are told to children, from mistaken notions of modesty, tend very early to inflame their imaginations and set their little minds to work respecting subjects which nature never intended they should think of till the body arrived at some degree of maturity. Then the passions naturally begin to take place of the senses, as instruments to unfold the understanding and form the moral character. In nurseries and boarding schools, I fear, girls are first spoiled, particularly in the latter. A number of girls sleep in the same room and wash together. And though I should be sorry to contaminate an innocent creature's mind by instilling false delicacy, or those indecent prudish notions, which early cautions respecting the other sex naturally engender, I should be very anxious to prevent their acquiring indelicate or immodest habits. And as many girls have learned very indelicate tricks, from ignorant servants, the mixing them thus indiscriminately together is very improper. To say the truth, women are, in general, too familiar with each other, which leads to that gross degree of familiarity that so frequently renders the marriage state unhappy. Why, in the name of decency, are sisters female intimates or ladies and their waiting women to be so grossly familiar as to forget the respect which one human creature owes to another. That squeamish delicacy which shrinks from the most disgusting offices when affection or humanity lead us to watch at a sick pillow is despicable. But why women in health should be more familiar with each other than men are, 
when they boast of their superior delicacy, is a solecism in manners which I could never solve. In order to preserve health and beauty, I should earnestly recommend frequent ablutions to dignify my advice that it may not offend the fastidious ear. And, by example, girls ought to be taught to wash and dress alone, without any distinction of rank, and if custom should make them require some little assistance, let them not require it till that part of the business is over which ought never to be done before a fellow creature, because it is an insult to the majesty of human nature, not on the score of modesty, but decency, for the care which some modest women take, making at the same time a display of that care not to let their legs be seen, is as childish as immodest. I could proceed still further, till I animadverted on some still more indelicate customs, which men never fall into. Secrets are told where silence ought to reign, and that regard to cleanliness, which some religious sects have perhaps carried too far, especially the Essenes amongst the Jews, by making that an insult to God, which is only an insult to humanity, is violated in a brutal manner. How can delicate women obtrude on notice that part of the animal economy which is so very disgusting? And is it not very rational to conclude that the women who have not been taught to respect the human nature of their own sex in these particulars will not long respect the mere difference of sex in their husbands? After their maidenish bashfulness is once lost, I, in fact, have generally observed that women fall into old habits and treat their husbands as they did their sisters or female acquaintance. Besides, women from necessity, because their minds are not cultivated, have recourse very often to what I familiarly term bodily wit and their intimacies are of the same kind. In short, with respect to both mind and body, they are too intimate. That decent personal reserve, which is the foundation of dignity of character, must be kept up between women, or their minds will never gain strength or modesty. On this account also, I object to many females being shut up together in nurseries, schools, or convents. I cannot recollect without indignation the jokes and hoyden tricks which knots of young women indulged themselves in when in my youth accident threw me an awkward rustic in their way. They were almost on a par with the double meanings which shake the convivial table when the glass has circulated freely. But it is vain to attempt to keep the heart pure unless the head is furnished with ideas and set to work to compare them in order to acquire judgment by generalizing simple ones. And modesty by making the understanding damp the sensibility. It may be thought that I lay too great a stress on personal reserve, but it is ever the handmaid of modesty, so that were I to name the graces that ought to adorn beauty, I should instantly exclaim cleanliness, neatness, and personal reserve. It is obvious, I suppose, that the reserve I mean has nothing sexual in it, and that I think it equally necessary in both sexes. So necessary indeed is that reserve and cleanliness which indolent women too often neglect, that I will venture to affirm 
that when two or three women live in the same house, the one will be most respected by the male part of the family who reside with them, leaving love entirely out of the question, who pays this kind of habitual respect to her person. When domestic friends meet in a morning, there will naturally prevail an affectionate seriousness, especially if each look forward to the discharge of daily duties. And it may be reckoned fanciful, but this sentiment has frequently risen spontaneously in my mind. I have been pleased, after breathing the sweet, bracing morning air, to see the same kind of freshness in the countenances I particularly loved. I was glad to see them braced, as it were, for the day, and ready to run their course with the sun. The greetings of affection in the morning are by these means more respectful than the familiar tenderness which frequently prolongs the evening talk. Nay, I have often felt hurt, not to say disgusted, when a friend has appeared whom I parted with full-dressed the evening before, with her clothes huddled on because she chose to indulge herself in bed till the last moment. Domestic affection can only be kept alive by these neglected attentions. Yet, if men and women took half as much pains to dress habitually neat as they do to ornament or rather to disfigure their persons, much would be done towards the attainment of purity of mind. But women only dress to gratify men of gallantry, for the lover is always best pleased with the simple garb that sits close to the shape. There is an impertinence in ornaments that rebuffs affection, because love always clings round the idea of home. As a sex, women are habitually indolent, and everything tends to make them so. I do not forget the starts of activity which sensibility produces, but as these flights of feeling only increase the evil, they are not to be confounded with the slow, orderly walk of reason. So great, in reality, is their mental and bodily indolence, that till their body be strengthened and their understanding enlarged by active exertions, there is little reason to expect that modesty will take place of bashfulness. They may find it prudent to assume its semblance, but the fair veil will only be worn on gala days. Perhaps there is not a virtue that mixes so kindly with every other as modesty. It is the pale moonbeam that renders more interesting every virtue it softens, giving mild grandeur to the contracted horizon. Nothing can be more beautiful than the poetical fiction which makes Diana, with her silver crescent, the goddess of chastity. I have sometimes thought that wandering with sedate step in some lonely recess, a modest dame of antiquity must have felt a glow of conscious dignity when after contemplating the soft, shadowy landscape, she has invited with placid fervour the mild reflection of her sister's beams to turn to her chaste bosom. A Christian has still nobler motives to incite her to preserve her chastity and acquire modesty, for her body has been called the temple of the living God, of that God who requires more than modesty of mien. His eye searcheth the heart, and let her remember that if she hopeth to find favour in the sight of purity itself, her chastity 
must be founded on modesty and not on worldly prudence. Or verily a good reputation will be her only reward for that awful intercourse, that sacred communion which virtue establishes between man and his maker must give rise to the wish of being pure as he is pure. After the foregoing remarks, it is almost superfluous to add that I consider all those feminine airs of maturity which succeed bashfulness, to which truth is sacrificed, to secure the heart of a husband, or rather to force him to be still a lover when nature would, had she not been interrupted in her operations, have made love give place to friendship. As immodest, the tenderness which a man will feel for the mother of his children is an excellent substitute for the ardour of unsatisfied passion. But to prolong that ardour, it is indelicate not to say immodest, for women to feign an unnatural coldness of constitution. Women as well as men ought to have the common appetites and passions of their nature. They are only brutal when unchecked by reason. But the obligation to check them is the duty of mankind, not a sexual duty. Nature, in these respects, may safely be left to herself. Let women only acquire knowledge and humanity, and love will teach them modesty. There is no need of falsehoods, disgusting as futile, for studied rules of behaviour only impose on shallow observers. A man of sense soon sees through and despises the affectation. The behaviour of young people to each other, as men and women, is the last thing that should be thought of in education. In fact, behaviour in most circumstances is now so much thought of that simplicity of character is rarely to be seen. Yet, if men were only anxious to cultivate each virtue and let it take root firmly in the mind, the grace resulting from it, its natural exterior mark, would soon strip affectation of its flaunting plumes, because fallacious as unstable is the conduct that is not founded upon truth. Would ye, O oh my sisters, really possess modesty? Ye must remember that the possession of virtue of any denomination is incompatible with ignorance and vanity. Ye must acquire that soberness of mind which the exercise of duties and the pursuit of knowledge alone inspire, or ye will still remain in a doubtful, dependent situation, and only be loved whilst ye are fair. The downcast eye, the rosy blush, the retiring grace are all proper in their season. But modesty, being the child of reason, cannot long exist with the sensibility that is not tempered by reflection. Besides, when Love, even innocent love, is the whole employ of your lives. Your hearts will be too soft to afford modesty that tranquil retreat where she delights to dwell in close union with humanity. Chapter 8 Morality Undermined by Sexual Notions of the Importance of a Good Reputation it has long since occurred to me that advice respecting behaviour and all the various modes of preserving 
a good reputation, which had been so strenuously inculcated on the female world, were specious poisons that encrusting morality eat away the substance, and that this measuring of shadows produced a false calculation because their length depends so much on the height of the sun and other adventitious circumstances. From whence arises the easy, fallacious behaviour of a courtier? From this situation, undoubtedly. For standing in need of dependence, he is obliged to learn the art of denying without giving offence, and of evasively feeding hope with the chameleon's food. Thus does politeness sport with truth, and eating away the sincerity and humanity natural to man, produce the fine gentleman. Women, in the same way, acquire from a supposed necessity an equally artificial mode of behaviour. Yet truth is not with impunity to be sported with, for the practised dissembler at last becomes the dupe of his own arts, loses that sagacity which has been justly termed common sense, namely a quick perception of common truths, which are constantly received as such by the unsophisticated mind, though it might not have had sufficient energy to discover them itself when obscured by local prejudices. The greater number of people take their opinions on trust to avoid the trouble of exercising their own minds, and these indolent beings naturally adhere to the letter rather than the spirit of a law, divine or human. Women, says some author, I cannot recollect who, mind not what only heaven sees. Why, indeed, should they? It is the eye of man that they have been taught to dread, and if they can lull their Argus to sleep, they seldom think of heaven or themselves, because their reputation is safe. And it is reputation, not chastity, and all its fair train, that they are employed to keep free from spot, not as a virtue, but to preserve their station in the world. To prove the truth of this remark, I need only advert to the intrigues of married women, particularly in high life, and in countries where women are suitably married, according to their respective ranks, by their parents. If an innocent girl become a prey to love, she is degraded for ever, though her mind was not polluted by the arts which married women under the convenient cloak of marriage practice. Nor has she violated any duty but the duty of respecting herself. The married woman, on the contrary, breaks a most sacred engagement, and becomes a cruel mother when she is a false and faithless wife. If her husband has still an affection for her, the arts which she must practice to deceive him will render her the most contemptible of human beings. And, at any rate, the contrivances necessary to preserve appearances will keep her mind in that childish or vicious tumult which destroys all its energy. Besides, in time, like those people who habitually take cordials to raise their spirits, she will want an intrigue to give life to her thoughts, having lost all relish for pleasures that are not highly seasoned by hope or fear. Sometimes married women act still more audaciously. I will mention an instance. A woman of quality, notorious for her gallantries, 
though as she still lived with her husband, nobody chose to place her in the class where she ought to have been placed, made a point of treating with the most insulting contempt a poor, timid creature, abashed by a sense of her former weakness, whom a neighbouring gentleman had seduced and afterwards married. This woman had actually confounded virtue with reputation, and I do believe valued herself on the propriety of her behaviour before marriage, though when once settled to the satisfaction of her family, she and her lord were equally faithless, so that the half-alive heir to an immense estate came from heaven knows where. To view this subject in another light. I have known a number of women who, if they did not love their husbands, loved nobody else, giving themselves entirely up to vanity and dissipation, neglecting every domestic duty, nay, even squandering away all the money which should have been saved for their helpless younger children, yet have plumed themselves on their unsullied reputation, as if the whole compass of their duty as wives and mothers was only to preserve it. Whilst other indolent women, neglecting every personal duty, have thought that they deserved their husband's affection because they acted in this respect with propriety, weak minds, are always fond of resting in the ceremonials of duty. But morality offers much simpler motives, and it were to be wished that superficial moralists had said less respecting behaviour and outward observances, for unless virtue of any kind is built on knowledge, it will only produce a kind of insipid decency. Respect for the opinion of the world has, however, been termed the principal duty of woman, in the most express words, for Rousseau declares that reputation is no less indispensable than chastity. A man, adds he, secure in his own good conduct, depends only on himself, and may brave the public opinion. But a woman, in behaving well, performs but half her duty, as what is thought of her is as important to her as what she really is. It follows hence that the system of a woman's education should in this respect be directly contrary to that of ours. Opinion is the grave of virtue among the men, but its throne among women. It is strictly logical to infer that the virtue that rests on opinion is merely worldly, and that it is the virtue of a being to whom reason has been denied. But even with respect to the opinion of the world, I am convinced that this class of reasoners are mistaken. This regard for reputation, independent of its being one of the natural rewards of virtue, however, took its rise from a cause that I have already deplored as the grand source of female depravity, the impossibility of regaining respectability by a return to virtue, though men preserve theirs during the indulgence of vice. It was natural for women, then, to endeavour to preserve what, once lost, was lost for ever, till this care, swallowing up every other care, reputation for chastity became the one thing needful to the sex. But vain is the scrupulosity of ignorance, for neither religion nor virtue, when they reside in the heart, require such a puerile attention to mere ceremonies, 
because the behaviour must, upon the whole, be proper when the motive is pure. To support my opinion, I can produce very respectable authority, and the authority of a cool reasoner ought to have weight to enforce consideration, though not to establish a sentiment. Speaking of the general laws of morality, Dr. Smith observes that by some very extraordinary and unlucky circumstance, a good man may come to be suspected of a crime of which he was altogether incapable, and upon that account be most unjustly exposed for the remaining part of his life to the horror and aversion of mankind. By an accident of this kind, he may be said to lose his all, notwithstanding his integrity and justice, in the same manner as a cautious man, notwithstanding his utmost circumspection, may be ruined by an earthquake or an inundation. Accidents of the first kind, however, are perhaps still more rare and still more contrary to the common course of things than those of the second. And it still remains true that the practice of truth, justice, and humanity is a certain and almost infallible method of acquiring what those virtues chiefly aim at, the confidence and love of those we live with. A person may be easily misrepresented with regard to a particular action, but it is scarcely possible that he should be so with regard to the general tenor of his conduct. An innocent man may be believed to have done wrong. This, however, will rarely happen. On the contrary, the established opinion of the innocence of his manners will often lead us to absolve him where he has really been in the fault, notwithstanding very strong presumptions. I perfectly coincide in opinion with this writer, for I verily believe that few of either sex were ever despised for certain vices without deserving to be despised. I speak not of the calumny of the moment which hangs over a character like one of the dense fogs of November over this metropolis till it gradually subsides before the common light of day. I only contend that the daily conduct of the majority prevails to stamp their character with the impression of truth. Quietly does the clear light, shining day after day, refute the ignorant surmise or malicious tale which has thrown dirt on a pure character. A false light, distorted for a short time its shadow reputation, but it seldom fails to become just when the cloud is dispersed that produced the mistake in vision. Many people, undoubtedly in several respects, obtain a better reputation than, strictly speaking, they deserve. For unremitting industry will mostly reach its goal in all races. They who only strive for this paltry prize, like the Pharisees, who prayed at the corners of streets to be seen of men, verily obtain the reward they seek, for the heart of man cannot be read by man. Still the fair fame that is naturally reflected by good actions, when the man is only employed to direct his steps aright, regardless of the lookers-on, is in general not only more true, but more sure. There are, it is true, trials when the good man must appeal to God from the injustice of man. And amidst the whining candour or hissing of envy, erect a pavilion in his own mind to retire to, till the rumour be overpassed. Nay, 
the darts of undeserved censure may pierce an innocent, tender bosom through with many sorrows. But these are all exceptions to general rules. And it is according to these common laws that human behaviour ought to be regulated. The eccentric orbit of the comet never influences astronomical calculations respecting the invariable order established in the motion of the principal bodies of the solar system. I will then venture to affirm that after a man has arrived at maturity, the general outline of his character in the world is just, allowing for the before-mentioned exceptions to the rule. I do not say that a prudent, worldly-wise man, with only negative virtues and qualities, may not sometimes obtain a smoother reputation than a wiser or a better man. So far from it that I am apt to conclude from experience that where the virtue of two people is nearly equal, the most negative character will be liked best by the world at large, whilst the other may have more friends in private life. But the hills and dales, clouds and sunshine, conspicuous in the virtues of great men, set off each other, and though they afford envious weakness a fairer mark to shoot at, the real character will still work its way to light, though bespattered by weak affection or ingenious malice. With respect to that anxiety to preserve a reputation hardly earned, which leads sagacious people to analyse it, I shall not make the obvious comment, but I am afraid that morality is very insidiously undermined in the female world by the attention being turned to the show instead of the substance. A simple thing is thus made strangely complicated. Nay, sometimes virtue and its shadow are set at variance. We should never, perhaps, have heard of Lucretia had she died to preserve her chastity instead of her reputation. If we really deserve our own good opinion, we shall commonly be respected in the world. But if we pant after higher improvement and higher attainments, it is not sufficient to view ourselves as we suppose that we are viewed by others, though this has been ingeniously argued as the foundation of our moral sentiments. Smith. Because each bystander may have his own prejudices, besides the prejudices of his age or country. We should rather endeavour to view ourselves as we suppose that being views us, who seeth each thought ripen into action, and whose judgment never swerves from the eternal rule of right. Righteous are all his judgments, just as merciful. The humble mind that seeketh to find favour in his sight, and calmly examines its conduct when only his presence is felt, will seldom form a very erroneous opinion of its own virtues. During the still hour of self-collection, the angry brow of offended justice will be fearfully deprecated, or the tie which draws man to the deity will be recognised in the pure sentiment of reverential adoration that swells the heart without exciting any tumultuous emotions. In these solemn moments, man discovers the germ of those vices which, like the Java tree, shed a pestiferous vapour around. Death is in the shade, 
and he perceives them without abhorrence, because he feels himself drawn by some cord of love to all his fellow creatures, for whose follies he is anxious to find every extenuation in their nature, in himself. If I, he may thus argue, who exercise my own mind, and have been refined by tribulation, find the serpent's egg in some fold of my heart, and crush it with difficulty, shall not I pity those who are stamped with less vigour, or who have heedlessly nurtured the insidious reptile, till it poisoned the vital stream it sucked? Can I, conscious of my secret sins, throw off my fellow creatures, and calmly see them drop into the chasm of perdition that yawns to receive them? No, no, the agonized heart will cry with suffocating impatience. I, too, am a man, and have vices, hid, perhaps, from human eye, that bend me to the dust before God, and loudly tell me, when all is mute, that we are formed of the same earth, and breathe the same element. Humanity thus rises naturally out of humility, and twists the cords of love that in various convolutions entangle the heart. This sympathy extends still further, till a man well pleased observes force in arguments that do not carry conviction to his own bosom, and he gladly places in the fairest light to himself the shows of reason that have led others astray, rejoiced to find some reason in all the errors of man though before convinced that he who rules the day makes his sun to shine on all. Yet, shaking hands thus, as it were, with corruption, one foot on earth, the other with bold strides, mounts to heaven, and claims kindred with superior natures. Virtues unobserved by men, drop their balmy fragrance at this cool hour, and the thirsty land, refreshed by the pure streams of comfort that suddenly gush out, is crowned with smiling verdure. This is the living green on which that eye may look with complacency that is too pure to behold iniquity. But my spirits flag, and I must silently indulge the reverie these reflections lead to, unable to describe the sentiments that have calmed my soul, when watching the rising sun, a soft shower drizzling through the leaves of neighbouring trees seemed to fall on my languid yet tranquil spirits, to cool the heart that had been heated by the passions which reason laboured to tame. The leading principles which run through all my disquisitions would render it unnecessary to enlarge on this subject. If a constant attention to keep the varnish of the character fresh and in good condition were not often inculcated as the sum total of female duty, if rules to regulate the behaviour and to preserve the reputation did not too frequently supersede moral obligations. But with respect to reputation, the attention is confined to a single virtue, chastity. If the honour of a woman, as it is absurdly called, is safe, she may neglect every social duty, nay, ruin her family by gaming and extravagance, yet still present a shameless front, for truly she is an honourable woman.
Mrs. Macaulay has justly observed that there is but one fault which a woman of honour may not commit with impunity. She then justly and humanely adds, This has given rise to the trite and foolish observation that the first fault against chastity in woman has a radical power to deprave the character. But no such frail beings come out of the hands of nature. The human mind is built of nobler materials than to be so easily corrupted. And with all their disadvantages of situation and education, women seldom become entirely abandoned till they are thrown into a state of desperation by the venomous rancour of their own sex. But in proportion as this regard for the reputation of chastity is prized by women, it is despised by men. And the two extremes are equally destructive to morality. Men are certainly more under the influence of their appetites than women, and their appetites are more depraved by unbridled indulgence and the fastidious contrivances of satiety. Luxury has introduced a refinement in eating that destroys the constitution, and a degree of gluttony which is so beastly that a perception of seemliness of behaviour must be worn out before one being could eat immoderately in the presence of another, and afterwards complain of the oppression that his intemperance naturally produced. Some women, particularly French women, have also lost a sense of decency in this respect, for they will talk very calmly of an indigestion. It were to be wished that idleness was not allowed to generate on the rank soil of wealth those swarms of summer insects that feed on putrefaction. We should not then be disgusted by the sight of such brutal excesses. There is one rule relative to behaviour that I think ought to regulate every other, and it is simply to cherish such an habitual respect for mankind as may prevent us from disgusting a fellow creature for the sake of a present indulgence. The shameful indolence of many married women and others a little advanced in life frequently leads them to sin against delicacy. For though convinced that the person is the band of union between the sexes, yet how often do they, from sheer indolence or to enjoy some trifling indulgence, disgust. The depravity of the appetite which brings the sexes together has had a still more fatal effect. Nature must ever be the standard of taste, the gauge of appetite. Yet how grossly is nature insulted by the voluptuary. Leaving the refinements of love out of the question, nature, by making the gratification of an appetite in this respect, as well as every other, a natural and imperious law to preserve the species, exalts the appetite and mixes a little mind and affection with a sensual gust. The feelings of a parent mingling with an instinct merely animal give it dignity, and the man and woman often meeting on account of the child, a mutual interest and affection is excited by the exercise of a common sympathy. Women, then, having necessarily some duty to fulfil, more noble than to adorn their persons, would not contentedly be the slaves of casual appetite, which is now the situation 
of a very considerable number who are, literally speaking, standing dishes to which every glutton may have access. I may be told that great as this enormity is, it only affects a devoted part of the sex, devoted for the salvation of the rest. But false as every assertion might easily be proved that recommends the sanctioning a small evil to produce a greater good, the mischief does not stop here, for the moral character and peace of mind of the chaster part of the sex is undermined by the conduct of the very women to whom they allow no refuge from guilt, whom they inexorably consign to the exercise of arts that lure their husbands from them, debauch their sons, and force them, let not modest women start, to assume in some degree the same character themselves. For I will venture to assert that all the causes of female weakness as well as depravity, which I have already enlarged on, branch out of one grand cause, want of chastity in men. This intemperance so prevalent depraves the appetite to such a degree that a wanton stimulus is necessary to rouse it. But the parental design of nature is forgotten, and the mere person, and that for a moment alone, engrosses the thoughts. So voluptuous indeed often grows the lustful prowler that he refines on female softness. To satisfy this genius of men, women are made systematically voluptuous. And though they may not all carry their libertinism to the same height, yet this heartless intercourse with the sex, which they allow themselves, depraves both sexes, because the taste of men is vitiated, and women of all classes naturally square their behaviour to gratify the taste by which they obtain pleasure and power. Women, becoming consequently weaker in mind and body than they ought to be, were one of the grand ends of their being taken into the account, that of bearing and nursing children, have not sufficient strength to discharge the first duty of a mother, and sacrificing to lasciviousness the parental affection that ennobles instinct either destroy the embryo in the womb or cast it off when born. Nature in everything demands respect, and those who violate her laws seldom violate them with impunity. The weak, enervated women who particularly catch the attention of libertines, are unfit to be mothers, though they may conceive, so that the rich sensualist, who has rioted among women, spreading depravity and misery, when he wishes to perpetuate his name, receives from his wife only an half-formed being that inherits both its father's and mother's weakness. Contrasting the humanity of the present age with the barbarism of antiquity, great stress has been laid on the savage custom of exposing the children whom their parents could not maintain, whilst the man of sensibility, who thus perhaps complains, by his promiscuous amours, produces a most destructive barrenness and contagious flagitiousness of manners. Surely nature never intended that women, by satisfying an appetite, should frustrate the very purpose for which it was implanted. I have before observed that men 
ought to maintain the women whom they have seduced. This would be one means of reforming female manners and stopping an abuse that has an equally fatal effect on population and morals. Another, no less obvious, would be to turn the attention of woman to the real virtue of chastity. For to little respect has that woman a claim on the score of modesty, though her reputation may be white as the driven snow, who smiles on the libertine whilst she spurns the victims of his lawless appetites and their own folly. Besides, she has a taint of the same folly, pure as she esteems herself, when she studiously adorns her person only to be seen by men, to excite respectful sighs and all the idle homage of what is called innocent gallantry. Did women really respect virtue for its own sake, they would not seek for a compensation in vanity, for the self-denial which they are obliged to practice to preserve their reputation, nor would they associate with men who set reputation at defiance. The two sexes mutually corrupt and improve each other. This I believe to be an indisputable truth, extending it to every virtue. Chastity, modesty, public spirit, and all the noble train of virtues on which social virtue and happiness are built, should be understood and cultivated by all mankind, or they will be cultivated to little effect. And instead of furnishing the vicious or idle with a pretext for violating some sacred duty by terming it a sexual one, it would be wiser to show that nature has not made any difference, for that the unchaste man doubly defeats the purpose of nature by rendering women barren and destroying his own constitution, though he avoids the shame that pursues the crime in the other sex. These are the physical consequences. The moral are still more alarming, for virtue is only a nominal distinction when the duties of citizens, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, and directors of families become merely the selfish ties of convenience. Why, then, do philosophers look for public spirit? Public spirit must be nurtured by private virtue, or it will resemble the factitious sentiment which makes women careful to preserve their reputation and men their honour. A sentiment that often exists unsupported by virtue, unsupported by that sublime morality which makes the habitual breach of one duty a breach of the whole moral law. Chapter 9 Of the pernicious effects which arise from the unnatural distinctions established in society. From the respect paid to property flow as from a poisoned fountain most of the evils and vices which render this world such a dreary scene to the contemplative mind. For it is in the most polished society that noisome reptiles and venomous serpents lurk under the rank herbage, and there is voluptuousness pampered by the still sultry air which relaxes every good disposition before it ripens into virtue. One class presses on another, for all are aiming to procure respect on account of their property, and property, once gained, will procure the respect due only to talents and virtue. 
Men neglect the duties incumbent on man, yet are treated like demigods. Religion is also separated from morality by a ceremonial veil, yet men wonder that the world is almost, literally speaking, a den of sharpers or oppressors. There is a homely proverb which speaks a shrewd truth, that whoever the devil finds idle, he will employ. And what but habitual idleness can hereditary wealth and titles produce? For man is so constituted that he can only attain a proper use of his faculties by exercising them, and will not exercise them unless necessity of some kind first set the wheels in motion. Virtue, likewise, can only be acquired by the discharge of relative duties, but the importance of these sacred duties will scarcely be felt by the being who is cajoled out of his humanity by the flattery of sycophants. There must be more equality established in society, or morality will never gain ground, and this virtuous equality will not rest firmly even when founded on a rock if one half of mankind are chained to its bottom by fate, for they will be continually undermining it through ignorance or pride. It is vain to expect virtue from women till they are in some degree independent of men. Nay, it is vain to expect that strength of natural affection which would make them good wives and good mothers. Whilst they are absolutely dependent on their husbands, they will be cunning, mean, and selfish. And the men who can be gratified by the fawning fondness of spaniel-like affection have not much delicacy, for love is not to be bought in any sense of the word. Its silken wings are instantly shriveled up when anything beside a return in kind is sought. Yet whilst wealth enervates men, and women live, as it were, by their personal charms, how can we expect them to discharge those ennobling duties which equally require exertion and self-denial? Hereditary property sophisticates the mind, and the unfortunate victims to it, if I may so express myself, swathed from their birth, seldom exert the locomotive faculty of body or mind, and thus, viewing everything through one medium, and that a false one, they are unable to discern in what true merit and happiness consist. False indeed must be the light when the drapery of situation hides the man and makes him stalk in masquerade, dragging from one scene of dissipation to another the nerveless limbs that hang with stupid listlessness and rolling round the vacant eye which plainly tells us that there is no mind at home. I mean, therefore, to infer that the society is not properly organized, which does not compel men and women to discharge their respective duties by making it the only way to acquire that countenance from their fellow creatures which every human being wishes some way to attain. The respect, consequently, which is paid to wealth and mere personal charms is a true northeast blast that blights the tender blossoms of affection and virtue. Nature has wisely attached affections to duties, to sweeten toil, and to give that vigour 
to the exertions of reason which only the heart can give. But the affection which is put on merely, because it is the appropriated insignia of a certain character when its duties are not fulfilled, is one of the empty compliments which vice and folly are obliged to pay to virtue and the real nature of things. To illustrate my opinion, I need only observe that when a woman is admired for her beauty and suffers herself to be so far intoxicated by the admiration she receives as to neglect to discharge the indispensable duty of a mother, she sins against herself by neglecting to cultivate an affection that would equally tend to make her useful and happy. True happiness, I mean all the contentment and virtuous satisfaction that can be snatched in this imperfect state, must arise from well-regulated affections, and an affection includes a duty. Men are not aware of the misery they cause, and the vicious weakness they cherish, by only inciting women to render themselves pleasing. They do not consider that they thus make natural and artificial duties clash by sacrificing the comfort and respectability of a woman's life to voluptuous notions of beauty, when in nature they all harmonize. Cold would be the heart of a husband were he not rendered unnatural by early debauchery, who did not feel more delight at seeing his child suckled by its mother than the most artful wanton tricks could ever raise. Yet this natural way of cementing the matrimonial tie and twisting esteem with fonder recollections, wealth leads women to spurn, to preserve their beauty, and wear the flowery crown of the day that gives them a kind of right to reign for a short time over the sex. They neglect to stamp impressions on their husbands' hearts that would be remembered with more tenderness when the snow on the head began to chill the bosom than even their virgin charms. The maternal solicitude of a reasonable, affectionate woman is very interesting, and the chastened dignity with which a mother returns the caresses that she and her child receive from a father who has been fulfilling the serious duties of his station is not only a respectable but a beautiful sight. So singular indeed are my feelings, and I have endeavoured not to catch factitious ones, that after having been fatigued with the sight of insipid grandeur and the slavish ceremonies that with cumbrous pomp supplied the place of domestic affections, I have turned to some other scene to relieve my eye by resting it on the refreshing green everywhere scattered by nature. I have then viewed with pleasure a woman nursing her children and discharging the duties of her station with perhaps merely a servant made to take off her hands the servile part of the household business. I have seen her prepare herself and children with only the luxury of cleanliness to receive her husband, who, returning weary home in the evening, found smiling babes and a clean hearth. My heart has loitered in the midst of the group and has even throbbed with sympathetic emotion when the scraping of the well-known foot has raised a pleasing tumult. Whilst my benevolence has been gratified by contemplating this artless picture, I have thought that a couple of this description, equally necessary and independent of each other, because each fulfilled the respective duties of their station, 
possessed all that life could give. Raised sufficiently above abject poverty, not to be obliged to weigh the consequence of every farthing they spend, and having sufficient to prevent their attending to a frigid system of economy which narrows both heart and mind. I declare so vulgar are my conceptions that I know not what is wanted to render this the happiest as well as the most respectable situation in the world, but a taste for literature, to throw a little variety and interest into social converse, and some superfluous money to give to the needy, and to buy books. For it is not pleasant when the heart is opened by compassion and the head active in arranging plans of usefulness, to have a prim urchin continually twitching back the elbow to prevent the hand from drawing out an almost empty purse, whispering at the same time some prudential maxim about the priority of justice. Destructive, however, as riches and inherited honours are to the human character, women are more debased and cramped if possible by them, than men, because men may still, in some degree, unfold their faculties by becoming soldiers and statesmen. As soldiers, I grant, they can now only gather, for the most part, vainglorious laurels, whilst they adjust to a hair the European balance, taking especial care that no bleak northern nook or sound incline the beam. But the days of true heroism are over when a citizen fought for his country like a Fabricius or a Washington and then returned to his farm to let his virtuous fervour run in a more placid but not a less salutary stream. No, our British heroes are oftener sent from the gaming-table than from the plough, and their passions have been rather inflamed by hanging with dumb suspense on the turn of a die than sublimated by panting after the adventurous march of virtue in the historic page. The statesman, it is true, might with more propriety quit the pharaoh bank or card table to guide the helm for he has still but to shuffle and trick the whole system of british politics if system it may courteously be called consisting in multiplying dependence and contriving taxes which grind the poor to pamper the rich thus a war or any wild goose chase is, as the vulgar use the phrase, a lucky turn-up of patronage for the minister, whose chief merit is the art of keeping himself in place. It is not necessary then that he should have bowels for the poor, so he can secure for his family the odd trick. Or should some show of respect for what is termed with ignorant ostentation an Englishman's birthright, be expedient to bubble the gruff mastiff that he has to lead by the nose, he can make an empty show very safely by giving his single voice and suffering his light squadron to file off to the other side. And when a question of humanity is agitated, he may dip a sop in the milk of human kindness to silence Cerberus, and talk of the interest which his heart takes in an attempt to make the earth no longer cry for vengeance as it sucks in its children's blood, though his cold hand may at the very moment rivet their chains by sanctioning the abominable traffic. A minister is no longer a minister than while he can carry a point, which he is determined to carry. Yet it is not necessary that a minister 
should feel like a man when a bold push might shake his seat. But to have done with these episodical observations, let me return to the more specious slavery which chains the very soul of woman, keeping her forever under the bondage of ignorance. The preposterous distinctions of rank, which render civilization a curse by dividing the world between voluptuous tyrants and cunning, envious dependents, corrupt almost equally every class of people, because respectability is not attached to the discharge of the relative duties of life, but to the station, and when the duties are not fulfilled, the affections cannot gain sufficient strength to fortify the virtue of which they are the natural reward. Still, there are some loopholes out of which a man may creep and dare to think and act for himself. But for a woman, it is an Herculean task, because she has difficulties peculiar to her sex to overcome, which require almost superhuman powers. A truly benevolent legislator always endeavours to make it the interest of each individual to be virtuous, and thus private virtue becoming the cement of public happiness, an orderly whole is consolidated by the tendency of all the parts towards a common centre. But the private or public virtue of women is very problematical. For Rousseau and a numerous list of male writers insist that she should all her life be subjected to a severe restraint, that of propriety. Why subject her to propriety, blind propriety, if she be capable of acting from a nobler spring, if she be an heir of immortality? Is sugar always to be produced by vital blood? Is one half of the human species, like the poor African slaves, to be subject to prejudices that brutalize them, when principles would be a surer guard only to sweeten the cup of man? Is not this indirectly to deny women reason, for a gift is a mockery if it be unfit for use. Women are in common with men rendered weak and luxurious by the relaxing pleasures which wealth procures. But added to this, they are made slaves to their persons and must render them alluring that man may lend them his reason to guide their tottering steps aright. Or should they be ambitious, they must govern their tyrants by sinister tricks, for without rights there cannot be any incumbent duties. The laws respecting woman, which I mean to discuss in a future part, make an absurd unit of a man and his wife. And then, by the easy transition of only considering him as responsible, she is reduced to a mere cipher. The being who discharges the duties of its station is independent, and, speaking of women at large, their first duty is to themselves as rational creatures, and the next, in point of importance, as citizens, is that which includes so many, of a mother. The rank in life which dispenses with their fulfilling this duty necessarily degrades them by making them mere dolls. Or should they turn to something more important than merely fitting drapery upon a smooth block, their minds are only occupied by some soft platonic attachment. Or the actual management of an intrigue may keep their thoughts in motion, for when they neglect domestic duties, they have it not in their power 
to take the field and march and countermarch like soldiers, or wrangle in the Senate to keep their faculties from rusting. I know that as a proof of the inferiority of the sex, Rousseau has exultingly exclaimed, How can they leave the nursery for the camp? And the camp has, by some moralists, been termed the school of the most heroic virtues, though I think it would puzzle a keen casuist to prove the reasonableness of the greater number of wars that have dubbed heroes. I do not mean to consider this question critically, because having frequently viewed these freaks of ambition as the first natural mode of civilization, when the ground must be torn up and the woods cleared by fire and sword, I do not choose to call them pests. But surely the present system of war has little connection with virtue of any denomination, being rather the school of finesse and effeminacy than of fortitude. Yet if defensive war the only justifiable war, in the present advanced state of society, where virtue can show its face and ripen amidst the rigours which purify the air on the mountain's top, were alone to be adopted as just and glorious, the true heroism of antiquity might again animate female bosoms. But fair and softly, gentle reader, male or female, do not alarm thyself, for though I have contrasted the character of a modern soldier with that of a civilized woman, I am not going to advise them to turn their distaff into a musket, though I sincerely wish to see the bayonet converted into a pruning hook. I only recreated an imagination fatigued by contemplating the vices and follies which all proceed from a feculent stream of wealth that has muddied the pure rills of natural affection by supposing that society will, some time or other, be so constituted that man must necessarily fulfil the duties of a citizen or be despised, and that while he was employed in any of the departments of civil life, his wife, also an active citizen, should be equally intent to manage her family, educate her children, and assist her neighbours. But to render her really virtuous and useful, she must not, if she discharge her civil duties, want individually the protection of civil laws. She must not be dependent on her husband's bounty for her subsistence during his life or support after his death. For how can a being be generous who has nothing of its own? All virtuous who is not free. The wife in the present state of things who is faithful to her husband and neither suckles nor educates her children scarcely deserves the name of a wife and has no right to that of a citizen. But take away natural rights and there is, of course, an end of duties. Women thus infallibly become only the wanton solace of men when they are so weak in mind and body that they cannot exert themselves unless to pursue some frothy pleasure or to invent some frivolous fashion. What can be a more melancholy sight to a thinking mind than to look into the numerous carriages that drive helter-skelter about this metropolis in a morning, full of pale-faced creatures who are flying from themselves. I have often wished with Dr. Johnson to place some of them in a little shop with half a dozen children looking up to their languid countenances 
for support. I am much mistaken if some latent vigour would not soon give health and spirit to their eyes, and some lines drawn by the exercise of reason on the blank cheeks, which before were only undulated by dimples, might restore lost dignity to the character, or rather enable it to attain the true dignity of its nature. Virtue is not to be acquired even by speculation, much less by the negative supineness that wealth naturally generates. Besides, when poverty is more disgraceful than even vice, is not morality cut to the quick? Still, to avoid misconstruction, though I consider that women in the common walks of life are called to fulfil the duties of wives and mothers by religion and reason, I cannot help lamenting that women of a superior caste have not a road open by which they can pursue more extensive plans of usefulness and independence. I may excite laughter by dropping an hint which I mean to pursue some future time, for I really think that women ought to have representatives, instead of being arbitrarily governed without having any direct share allowed them in the deliberations of government. But as the whole system of representation is now in this country only a convenient handle for despotism, they need not complain, for they are as well represented as a numerous class of hard-working mechanics who pay for the support of royalty when they can scarcely stop their children's mouths with bread. How are they represented whose very sweat supports the splendid stud of an heir apparent, or varnishes the chariot of some female favourite who looks down on shame. Taxes on the very necessaries of life enable an endless tribe of idle princes and princesses to pass with stupid pomp before a gaping crowd who almost worship the very parade which costs them so dear. This is mere Gothic grandeur, something like the barbarous useless parade of having sentinels on horseback at Whitehall, which I could never view without a mixture of contempt and indignation. How strangely must the mind be sophisticated when this sort of state impresses it. But till these monuments of folly are levelled by virtue, similar follies will leaven the whole mass. For the same character, in some degree, will prevail in the aggregate of society. And the refinements of luxury, or the vicious repinings of envious poverty, will equally banish virtue from society considered as the characteristic of that society, or only allow it to appear as one of the stripes of the harlequin coat worn by the civilised man. In the superior ranks of life, every duty is done by deputies, as if duties could ever be waived, and the vain pleasures which consequent idleness forces the rich to pursue appear so enticing to the next rank that the numerous scramblers for wealth sacrifice everything to tread on their heels. The most sacred trusts are then considered as sinecures because they were procured by interest and only sought to enable a man to keep good company. Women in particular all want to be ladies, which is simply to have nothing to do, but listlessly to go they scarcely care where, for they cannot tell what. But what have women to do in society, I may be asked, but to loiter with easy grace, 
Surely you would not condemn them all to suckle fools and chronicle small beer. No, women might certainly study the art of healing and be physicians as well as nurses. And midwifery, decency seems to allot to them, though I am afraid the word midwife in our dictionaries will soon give place to accoucheur, and one proof of the former delicacy of the sex be effaced from the language. They might also study politics and settle their benevolence on the broadest basis, for the reading of history will scarcely be more useful than the perusal of romances, if read as mere biography, if the character of the times, the political improvements, arts, etc., be not observed. In short, if it be not considered as the history of man, and not of particular men, who filled a niche in the temple of fame, and dropped into the black rolling stream of time, that silently sweeps all before it into the shapeless void called eternity. For shape can it be called, that shape hath none? Business of various kinds they might likewise pursue, if they were educated in a more orderly manner, which might save many from common and legal prostitution. Women would not then marry for a support, as men accept of places under government and neglect the implied duties, nor would an attempt to earn their own subsistence, a most laudable one, sink them almost to the level of those poor abandoned creatures who live by prostitution. For are not milliners and mantua-makers reckoned the next class? The few employments open to women so far from being liberal, are menial, and when a superior education enables them to take charge of the education of children as governesses, they are not treated like the tutors of sons, though even clerical tutors are not always treated in a manner calculated to render them respectable in the eyes of their pupils, to say nothing of the private comfort of the individual. But as women educated like gentlewomen are never designed for the humiliating situation which necessity sometimes forces them to fill, these situations are considered in the light of a degradation, and they know little of the human heart, who need to be told that nothing so painfully sharpens the sensibility as such a fall in life. Some of these women might be restrained from marrying by a proper spirit or delicacy, and others may not have had it in their power to escape in this pitiful way from servitude. Is not that government then very defective and very unmindful of the happiness of one half of its members that does not provide for honest, independent women by encouraging them to fill respectable stations. But in order to render their private virtue a public benefit, they must have a civil existence in the state, married or single, else we shall continually see some worthy woman whose sensibility has been rendered painfully acute by undeserved contempt, droop like the lily broken down by a ploughshare. It is a melancholy truth, yet such is the blessed effects of civilization. The most respectable women are the most oppressed, and unless they have understandings far superior to the common run of understandings, taking in both sexes, they must, from being treated like contemptible beings, become contemptible. How many women thus waste life away, the prey of discontent, who might have practised as physicians, regulated a farm, managed a shop, and stood erect, supported by their own industry, 
instead of hanging their heads surcharged with the dew of sensibility that consumes the beauty to which it at first gave lustre. Nay, I doubt whether pity and love are so near akin as poets feign, for I have seldom seen much compassion excited by the helplessness of females, unless they were fair. Then, perhaps, pity was the soft handmaid of love, or the harbinger of lust. How much more respectable is the woman who earns her own bread by fulfilling any duty than the most accomplished beauty. Beauty, did I say? So sensible am I of the beauty of moral loveliness, or the harmonious propriety that attunes the passions of a well-regulated mind, that I blush at making the comparison. Yet I sigh to think how few women aim at attaining this respectability by withdrawing from the giddy whirl of pleasure or the indolent calm that stupefies the good sort of women it sucks in. Proud of their weakness, however, they must always be protected, guarded from care and all the rough toils that dignify the mind. If this be the fiat of fate, if they will make themselves insignificant and contemptible, sweetly to waste life away, let them not expect to be valued when their beauty fades, for it is the fate of the fairest flowers to be admired and pulled to pieces by the careless hand that plucked them. In how many ways do I wish from the purest benevolence to impress this truth on my sex? Yet I fear that they will not listen to a truth that dear-bought experience has brought home to many an agitated bosom, nor willingly resign the privileges of rank and sex for the privileges of humanity, to which those have no claim who do not discharge its duties. Those writers are particularly useful, in my opinion, who make man feel for man, independent of the station he fills, or the drapery of factitious sentiments. I then would fain convince reasonable men of the importance of some of my remarks, and prevail on them to weigh dispassionately the whole tenor of my observations. I appeal to their understandings, and as a fellow creature claim in the name of my sex some interest in their hearts. I entreat them to assist to emancipate their companion, to make her a helpmeet for them. Would men but generously snap our chains, and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience, they would find us more observant daughters, more affectionate sisters, more faithful wives, more reasonable mothers, in a word, better citizens. We should then love them with true affection, because we should learn to respect ourselves and the peace of mind of a worthy man would not be interrupted by the idle vanity of his wife, nor his babes sent to nestle in a strange bosom, having never found a home in their mothers. Chapter 10 Parental Affection Parental affection is perhaps the blindest modification of perverse self-love. For we have not, like the French, two terms, l'amour propre, l'amour de soi-même, to distinguish the pursuit of a natural and reasonable desire from the ignorant calculations of weakness. Parents often love their children in the most brutal manner and sacrifice every relative duty to promote their advancement 
in the world. To promote, such as the perversity of unprincipled prejudices, the future welfare of the very beings whose present existence they embitter by the most despotic stretch of power. Power, in fact, is ever true to its vital principle, for in every shape it would reign without control or inquiry. Its throne is built across a dark abyss, which no eye must dare to explore, lest the baseless fabric should totter under investigation. Obedience, unconditional obedience, is the catchword of tyrants of every description. And to render assurance doubly sure, one kind of despotism supports another. Tyrants would have cause to tremble if reason were to become the rule of duty in any of the relations of life, for the light might spread till perfect day appeared. And when it did appear, how would men smile at the sight of the bugbears at which they started during the night of ignorance or the twilight of timid inquiry? Parental affection, indeed, in many minds, is but a pretext to tyrannize where it can be done with impunity. For only good and wise men are content with the respect that will bear discussion. Convinced that they have a right to what they insist on, they do not fear reason or dread the sifting of subjects that recur to natural justice, because they firmly believe that the more enlightened the human mind becomes, the deeper root will just and simple principles take. They do not rest in expedience or grant that what is metaphysically true can be practically false, but disdaining the shifts of the moment, they calmly wait till time sanctioning innovation silences the hiss of selfishness or envy. If the power of reflecting on the past and darting the keen eye of contemplation into futurity be the grand privilege of man, it must be granted that some people enjoy this prerogative in a very limited degree. Everything now appears to them wrong, and not able to distinguish the possible from the monstrous, they fear where no fear should find a place, running from the light of reason as if it were a firebrand. Yet the limits of the possible have never been defined to stop the sturdy innovator's hand. Woman, however, a slave in every situation to prejudice, seldom exerts enlightened maternal affection, for she either neglects her children or spoils them by improper indulgence. Besides, the affection of some women for their children is, as I have before termed it, frequently very brutish, for it eradicates every spark of humanity. Justice, truth, Everything is sacrificed by these Rebecca's, and for the sake of their own children they violate the most sacred duties, forgetting the common relationship that binds the whole family on earth together. Yet reason seems to say that they who suffer one duty or affection to swallow up the rest have not sufficient heart or mind to fulfil that one conscientiously. It then loses the venerable aspect of a duty and assumes the fantastic form of a whim, as the care of children in their infancy is one of the grand duties annexed to the female character by nature. This duty would afford many forcible arguments for strengthening the female understanding if it were properly considered. The formation of the mind 
must be begun very early, and the temper in particular requires the most judicious attention, an attention which women cannot pay who only love their children because they are their children, and seek no further for the foundation of their duty than in the feelings of the moment. It is this want of reason in their affections which makes women so often run into extremes and either be the most fond or most careless and unnatural mothers. To be a good mother, a woman must have sense and that independence of mind which few women possess who were taught to depend entirely on their husbands. Meek wives are in general foolish mothers, wanting their children to love them best and take their part in secret against the father who is held up as a scarecrow. If they are to be punished, though they have offended the mother, the father must inflict the punishment. He must be the judge in all disputes. But I shall more fully discuss this subject when I treat of private education. I now only mean to insist that unless the understanding of woman be enlarged and her character rendered more firm by being allowed to govern her own conduct, she will never have sufficient sense or command of temper to manage her children properly. Her parental affection, indeed, scarcely deserves the name when it does not lead her to suckle her children, because the discharge of this duty is equally calculated to inspire maternal and filial affection, and it is the indispensable duty of men and women to fulfil the duties which give birth to affections that are the surest preservatives against vice. Natural affection, as it is termed, I believe to be a very weak tie. Affections must grow out of the habitual exercise of a mutual sympathy. And what sympathy does a mother exercise who sends her babe to a nurse? and only takes it from a nurse to send it to a school. In the exercise of their natural feelings, Providence has furnished women with a natural substitute for love when the lover becomes only a friend and mutual confidence takes place of overstrained admiration. A child then gently twists the relaxing cord and a mutual care produces a new mutual sympathy. But a child, though a pledge of affection, will not enliven it if both father and mother are content to transfer the charge to hirelings. For they who do their duty by proxy should not murmur if they miss the reward of duty. Parental affection produces filial duty. Chapter 11. Duty to Parents. There seems to be an indolent propensity in man to make prescription always take place of reason, and to place every duty on an arbitrary foundation. The rights of kings are deduced in a direct line from the king of kings, and that of parents from our first parent. Why do we thus go back for principles that should always rest on the same base and have the same weight today that they had a thousand years ago and not a jot more? If parents discharge their duty, they have a strong hold and sacred claim on the gratitude of their children. But few parents are willing to receive the respectful affection of their offspring on such terms. They demand blind obedience, because they do not merit a reasonable service, and to render these demands of weakness and ignorance more binding, 
a mysterious sanctity is spread round the most arbitrary principle. For what other name can be given to the blind duty of obeying vicious or weak beings merely because they obeyed a powerful instinct? The simple definition of the reciprocal duty which naturally subsists between parent and child may be given in a few words. The parent who pays proper attention to helpless infancy has a right to require the same attention when the feebleness of age comes upon him. But to subjugate a rational being to the mere will of another after he is of age to answer to society for his own conduct is a most cruel and undue stretch of power and perhaps as injurious to morality as those religious systems which do not allow right and wrong to have any existence but in the divine will. I never knew a parent who had paid more than common attention to his children disregarded. Dr. Johnson makes the same observation. On the contrary, the early habit of relying almost implicitly on the opinion of a respected parent is not easily shaken, even when matured reason convinces the child that his father is not the wisest man in the world. This weakness, for a weakness it is, though the epithet amiable may be tacked to it, a reasonable man must steel himself against, for the absurd duty too often inculcated of obeying a parent only on account of his being a parent shackles the mind and prepares it for a slavish submission to any power but reason. I distinguish between the natural and accidental duty due to parents. The parent who sedulously endeavours to form the heart and enlarge the understanding of his child, has given that dignity to the discharge of a duty common to the whole animal world that only reason can give. This is the parental affection of humanity and leaves instinctive natural affection far behind. Such a parent acquires all the rights of the most sacred friendship, and his advice, even when his child is advanced in life, demands serious consideration. With respect to marriage, though after one and twenty a parent seems to have no right to withhold his consent on any account, yet twenty years of solicitude call for a return, and the son ought at least to promise not to marry for two or three years should the object of his choice not entirely meet with the approbation of his first friend. But respect for parents is, generally speaking, a much more debasing principle. It is only a selfish respect for property. The father who is blindly obeyed is obeyed from sheer weakness or from motives that degrade the human character. A great proportion of the misery that wanders in hideous forms around the world is allowed to rise from the negligence of parents. And still, these are the people who are most tenacious of what they term a natural right, though it be subversive of the birthright of man, the right of acting according to the direction of his own reason. I have already very frequently had occasion to observe that vicious or indolent people are always eager to profit by enforcing arbitrary privileges, and generally in the same proportion as they neglect the discharge of the duties which alone render the privileges reasonable. This is at the bottom 
a dictate of common sense, or the instinct of self-defense, peculiar to ignorant weakness, resembling that instinct which makes a fish muddy the water it swims in to elude its enemy, instead of boldly facing it in the clear stream. From the clear stream of argument, indeed, the supporters of prescription of every denomination fly, and taking refuge in the darkness which in the language of sublime poetry has been supposed to surround the throne of omnipotence, they dare to demand that implicit respect which is only due to his unsearchable ways. But let me not be thought presumptuous. The darkness which hides our God from us only respects speculative truths. It never obscures moral ones. They shine clearly, for God is light, and never by the constitution of our nature requires the discharge of a duty, the reasonableness of which does not beam on us when we open our eyes. The indolent parent of high rank may, it is true, extort a show of respect from his child, and females on the continent are particularly subject to the views of their families, who never think of consulting their inclination, or providing for the comfort of the poor victims of their pride. The consequence is notorious. These dutiful daughters become adulteresses and neglect the education of their children from whom they, in their turn, exact the same kind of obedience. Females, it is true, in all countries are too much under the dominion of their parents, and few parents think of addressing their children in the following manner, though it is in this reasonable way that heaven seems to command the whole human race. It is your interest to obey me till you can judge for yourself, and the Almighty Father of all has implanted an affection in me to serve as a guard to you whilst your reason is unfolding. But when your mind arrives at maturity, you must only obey me, or rather respect my opinions, so far as they coincide with the light that is breaking in on your own mind. A slavish bondage to parents cramps every faculty of the mind, and Mr. Locke very judiciously observes that if the mind be curbed and humbled too much in children, if their spirits be abased and broken much by too strict an hand over them, they lose all their vigour and industry. This strict hand may, in some degree, account for the weakness of women. For girls, from various causes, are more kept down by their parents in every sense of the word than boys. The duty expected from them is, like all the duties arbitrarily imposed on women, more from a sense of propriety, more out of respect for decorum than reason. And thus taught slavishly to submit to their parents, they are prepared for the slavery of marriage. I may be told that a number of women are not slaves in the marriage state. True but they then become tyrants. For it is not rational freedom, but a lawless kind of power resembling the authority exercised by the favourites of absolute monarchs, which they obtain by debasing means. I do not likewise dream of insinuating that either boys or girls are always slaves. I only insist that when they are obliged to submit to authority blindly, their faculties are weakened and their tempers rendered imperious or abject. 
I also lament that parents, indolently availing themselves of a supposed privilege, damp the first faint glimmering of reason, rendering at the same time the duty which they are so anxious to enforce an empty name, because they will not let it rest on the only basis on which a duty can rest securely. For unless it be founded on knowledge, it cannot gain sufficient strength to resist the squalls of passion or the silent sapping of self-love. But it is not the parents who have given the surest proof of their affection for their children, or to speak more properly, who by fulfilling their duty have allowed a natural parental affection to take root in their hearts, the child of exercised sympathy and reason, and not the overweening offspring of selfish pride, who most vehemently insist on their children submitting to their will merely because it is their will. On the contrary, the parent who sets a good example patiently lets that example work and it seldom fails to produce its natural effect, filial respect. Children cannot be taught too early to submit to reason the true definition of that necessity which Rousseau insisted on without defining it. For to submit to reason is to submit to the nature of things and to that God who formed them so to promote our real interest. Why should the minds of children be warped as they just begin to expand only to favour the indolence of parents who insist on a privilege without being willing to pay the price fixed by nature? I have before had occasion to observe that a right always includes a duty, and I think it may likewise fairly be inferred that they forfeit the right who do not fulfil the duty. It is easier, I grant, to command than reason. But it does not follow from hence that children cannot comprehend the reason why they are made to do certain things habitually. For, from a steady adherence to a few simple principles of conduct, flows that salutary power which a judicious parent gradually gains over a child's mind. And this power becomes strong indeed if tempered by an even display of affection brought home to the child's heart. For I believe, as a general rule, it must be allowed that the affection which we inspire always resembles that we cultivate so that natural affections, which have been supposed almost distinct from reason, may be found more nearly connected with judgment than is commonly allowed. Nay, as another proof of the necessity of cultivating the female understanding, it is but just to observe that the affections seem to have a kind of animal capriciousness when they merely reside in the heart. It is the irregular exercise of parental authority that first injures the mind. And to these irregularities, girls are more subject than boys. The will of those who never allow their will to be disputed, unless they happen to be in a good humour when they relax proportionally, is almost always unreasonable. To elude this arbitrary authority, girls very early learn the lessons which they afterwards practice on their husbands. For I have frequently seen a little sharp-faced miss rule a whole family, excepting that now and then mamma's anger will burst out of some accidental cloud. Either her hair was ill-dressed or she had lost more money at cards the night before than she was willing to own to her husband. 
or some such moral cause of anger. After observing sallies of this kind, I have been led into a melancholy train of reflection respecting females, concluding that when their first affection must lead them astray or make their duties clash till they rest on mere whims and customs, little can be expected from them as they advance in life. How indeed can an instructor remedy this evil? For to teach them virtue on any solid principle is to teach them to despise their parents. Children cannot, ought not, to be taught to make allowance for the faults of their parents, because every such allowance weakens the force of reason in their minds and makes them still more indulgent to their own. It is one of the most sublime virtues of maturity that leads us to be severe with respect to ourselves and forbearing to others. But children should only be taught the simple virtues, for if they begin too early to make allowance for human passions and manners, they wear off the fine edge of the criterion by which they should regulate their own and become unjust in the same proportion as they grow indulgent. The affections of children and weak people are always selfish. They love others because others love them, and not on account of their virtues. Yet, till esteem and love are blended together in the first affection, and reason made the foundation of the first duty, morality will stumble at the threshold. But till society is very differently constituted, parents, I fear, will still insist on being obeyed because they will be obeyed, and constantly endeavour to settle that power on a divine right which will not bear the investigation of reason. Chapter 12 On National Education The good effects resulting from attention to private education will ever be very confined, and the parent who really puts his own hand to the plough will always, in some degree, be disappointed till education becomes a grand national concern. A man cannot retire into a desert with his child, and if he did, he could not bring himself back to childhood and become the proper friend and playfellow of an infant or youth. And when children are confined to the society of men and women, they very soon acquire that kind of premature manhood which stops the growth of every vigorous power of mind or body. In order to open their faculties, they should be excited to think for themselves, and this can only be done by mixing a number of children together and making them jointly pursue the same objects. A child very soon contracts a benumbing indolence of mind, which he has seldom sufficient vigour to shake off, when he only asks a question instead of seeking for information, and then relies implicitly on the answer he receives. With his equals in age, this could never be the case, and the subjects of inquiry, though they might be influenced, would not be entirely under the direction of men who frequently damp, if not destroy, abilities by bringing them forward too hastily. And too hastily they will infallibly be brought forward if the child could be confined to the society of a man, however sagacious that man may be. Besides, in youth the seeds of every affection should be sown, and the respectful regard which is felt for a parent is very different from the social affections that are to constitute the happiness of life as it advances. Of these, 
equality is the basis, and an intercourse of sentiments unclogged by that observant seriousness which prevents disputation, though it may not enforce submission. Let a child have ever such an affection for his parent, he will always languish to play and chat with children. And the very respect he entertains, for filial esteem always has a dash of fear mixed with it, will, if it do not teach him cunning, at least prevent him from pouring out the little secrets which first open the heart to friendship and confidence, gradually leading to more expansive benevolence. Added to this, he will never acquire that frank ingenuousness of behaviour which young people can only attain by being frequently in society where they dare to speak what they think, neither afraid of being reproved for their presumption nor laughed at for their folly. Forcibly impressed by the reflections which the sight of schools as they are at present conducted naturally suggested, I have formally delivered my opinion rather warmly in favour of a private education, but further experience has led me to view the subject in a different light. I still, however, think schools, as they are now regulated, the hotbeds of vice and folly, and the knowledge of human nature supposed to be attained there merely cunning selfishness. At school, boys become gluttons and slovens, and instead of cultivating domestic affections, very early rush into the libertinism which destroys the constitution before it is formed, hardening the heart as it weakens the understanding. I should in fact be averse to boarding schools if it were for no other reason than the unsettled state of mind which the expectation of the vacations produce. On these the children's thoughts are fixed with eager, anticipating hopes for, at least to speak with moderation, half of the time, and when they arrive they are spent in total dissipation and beastly indulgence. But, on the contrary, when they are brought up at home, though they may pursue a plan of study in a more orderly manner than can be adopted when near a fourth part of the year is actually spent in idleness and as much more in regret and anticipation, yet they there acquire too high an opinion of their own importance from being allowed to tyrannise over servants and from the anxiety expressed by most mothers on the score of manners, who, eager to teach the accomplishments of a gentleman, stifle in their birth the virtues of a man. Thus brought into company when they ought to be seriously employed, and treated like men when they are still boys, they become vain and effeminate. The only way to avoid two extremes equally injurious to morality would be to contrive some way of combining a public and private education, thus to make men citizens two natural steps might be taken which seem directly to lead to the desired point. For the domestic affections that first open the heart to the various modifications of humanity would be cultivated, whilst the children were nevertheless allowed to spend great part of their time on terms of equality with other children. I still recollect with pleasure the country day school, where a boy trudged in the morning, wet or dry, carrying his books and his dinner, if it were at a considerable distance, a servant did not then lead master by the hand, for when he had once put on coat and breeches, he was allowed to shift for himself, and return alone in the evening to recount the feats of the day close at the parental knee. 
His father's house was his home, and was ever after fondly remembered. Nay, I appeal to some superior men who were educated in this manner, whether the recollection of some shady lane where they conned their lesson, or of some stile where they sat making a kite or mending a bat, has not endeared their country to them. But what boy ever recollected with pleasure the years he spent in close confinement at an academy near London, unless indeed he should by chance remember the poor scarecrow of an usher whom he tormented, or the tart man from whom he caught a cake to devour it with the cattish appetite of selfishness. At boarding schools of every description, the relaxation of the junior boys is mischief, and of the senior, vice. Besides, in great schools, what can be more prejudicial to the moral character than the system of tyranny and abject slavery, which is established amongst the boys, to say nothing of the slavery to forms, which makes religion worse than a farce? For what good can be expected from the youth who receives the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to avoid forfeiting half a guinea, which he probably afterwards spends in some sensual manner? Half the employment of the youths is to elude the necessity of attending public worship. And well they may, for such a constant repetition of the same thing must be a very irksome restraint on their natural vivacity. As these ceremonies have the most fatal effect on their morals, and as a ritual performed by the lips when the heart and mind are far away, is not now stored up by our church as a bank to draw on for the fees of the poor souls in purgatory, why should they not be abolished? But the fear of innovation in this country extends to everything. This is only a covert fear, the apprehensive timidity of indolent slugs who guard by sliming it over the snug place, which they consider in the light of an hereditary estate, and eat, drink, and enjoy themselves instead of fulfilling the duties excepting a few empty forms for which it was endowed. These are the people who most strenuously insist on the will of the founder being observed, crying out against all reformation as if it were a violation of justice. I am now alluding particularly to the relics of popery retained in our colleges, where the Protestant members seem to be such sticklers for the established church. But their zeal never makes them lose sight of the spoil of ignorance, which rapacious priests of superstitious memory have scraped together. No, wise in their generation, they venerate the prescriptive right of possession as a stronghold, and still let the sluggish bell tinkle to prayers, as during the days when the elevation of the host was supposed to atone for the sins of the people, lest one reformation should lead to another, and the spirit kill the letter. These Romish customs have the most baneful effect on the morals of our clergy. For the idle vermin who two or three times a day perform in the most slovenly manner a service which they think useless but call their duty, soon lose a sense of duty. At college, forced to attend or evade public worship, they acquire an habitual contempt for the very service, the performance of which is to enable them to live in idleness. It is mumbled over as an affair of business, as a stupid boy repeats his task, and frequently the college cant escapes from the preacher the moment after he has left the pulpit, 
and even whilst he is eating the dinner which he earned in such a dishonest manner. Nothing indeed can be more irreverent than the cathedral service as it is now performed in this country. Neither does it contain a set of weaker men than those who are the slaves of this childish routine. A disgusting skeleton of the former state is still exhibited, but all the solemnity that interested the imagination, if it did not purify the heart, is stripped off. The performance of high mass on the continent must impress every mind where a spark of fancy glows, with that awful melancholy, that sublime tenderness, so near akin to devotion. I do not say that these devotional feelings are of more use in a moral sense than any other emotion of taste, but I contend that the theatrical pomp which gratifies our senses is to be preferred to the cold parade that insults the understanding without reaching the heart. Amongst remarks on national education, such observations cannot be misplaced, especially as the supporters of these establishments degenerated into puerilities affect to be the champions of religion. Religion, pure source of comfort in this vale of tears, how has thy clear stream been muddied by the dabblers who have presumptuously endeavoured to confine in one narrow channel the living waters that ever flow toward God, the sublime ocean of existence? What would life be without that peace which the love of God, when built on humanity, alone can impart? Every earthly affection turns back at intervals to prey upon the heart that feeds it, and the purest effusions of benevolence, often rudely damped by men, must mount as a free-will offering to him who gave them birth, whose bright image they faintly reflect. In public schools, however, religion, confounded with irksome ceremonies and unreasonable restraints, assumes the most ungracious aspect. Not the sober, austere one that commands respect whilst it inspires fear, but a ludicrous cast that serves to point a pun. For, in fact, most of the good stories and smart things which enliven the spirits that have been concentrated at whist are manufactured out of the incidents to which the very men labour to give a droll turn who countenance the abuse to live on the spoil. There is not, perhaps, in the kingdom a more dogmatical or luxurious set of men than the pedantic tyrants who reside in colleges and preside at public schools. The vacations are equally injurious to the morals of the masters and pupils, and the intercourse which the former keep up with the nobility introduces the same vanity and extravagance into their families which banish domestic duties and comforts from the lordly mansion, whose state is awkwardly aped on a smaller scale. The boys, who live at a great expense with the masters and assistants, are never domesticated, though placed there for that purpose, for after a silent dinner they swallow a hasty glass of wine and retire to plan some mischievous trick or to ridicule the person or manners of the very people they have just been cringing to, and whom they ought to consider as the representatives of their parents. Can it then be a matter of surprise that boys become selfish and vicious, who are thus shut out from social converse, or that a mitre often graces the brow of one of these diligent pastors? The desire of living in the same style as the rank just above them 
infects each individual and every class of people, and meanness is the concomitant of this ignoble ambition. But those professions are most debasing, whose ladder is patronage, yet out of one of these professions the tutors of youth are, in general, chosen. But can they be expected to inspire independent sentiments, whose conduct must be regulated by the cautious prudence that is ever on the watch for preferment. So far, however, from thinking of the morals of boys, I have heard several masters of schools argue that they only undertook to teach Latin and Greek, and that they had fulfilled their duty by sending some good scholars to college. A few good scholars, I grant, may have been formed by emulation and discipline, but to bring forward these clever boys, the health and morals of a number have been sacrificed. The sons of our gentry and wealthy commoners are mostly educated at these seminaries, and will any one pretend to assert that the majority, making every allowance, come under the description of tolerable scholars. It is not for the benefit of society that a few brilliant men should be brought forward at the expense of the multitude. It is true that great men seem to start up, as great revolutions occur, at proper intervals, to restore order and to blow aside the clouds that thicken over the face of truth. But let more reason and virtue prevail in society, and these strong winds would not be necessary. Public education of every denomination should be directed to form citizens. But if you wish to make good citizens, you must first exercise the affections of a son and a brother. This is the only way to expand the heart. For public affections, as well as public virtues, must ever grow out of the private character, or they are merely meteors that shoot athwart a dark sky, and disappear as they are gazed at and admired. Few, I believe, have had much affection for mankind who did not first love their parents, their brothers, sisters, and even the domestic brutes whom they first played with. The exercise of youthful sympathies forms the moral temperature, and it is the recollection of these first affections and pursuits that gives life to those that are afterwards more under the direction of reason. In youth the fondest friendships are formed, the genial juices mounting at the same time kindly mix, or rather the heart, tempered for the reception of friendship, is accustomed to seek for pleasure in something more noble than the churlish gratification of appetite. In order, then, to inspire a love of home and domestic pleasures, children ought to be educated at home, for riotous holidays only make them fond of home for their own sakes. Yet the vacations, which do not foster domestic affections, continually disturb the course of study and render any plan of improvement abortive, which includes temperance. Still, were they abolished, children would be entirely separated from their parents, and I question whether they would become better citizens by sacrificing the preparatory affections, by destroying the force of relationships that render the marriage state as necessary as respectable. But if a private education produce self-importance or insulates a man in his family, the evil is only shifted, not remedied. This train of reasoning brings me back to a subject on which I mean to dwell, the necessity of establishing proper day schools. 
but these should be national establishments. For whilst schoolmasters are dependent on the caprice of parents, little exertion can be expected from them, more than is necessary to please ignorant people. Indeed, the necessity of a master's giving the parents some sample of the boy's abilities, which during the vacation is shown to every visitor, is productive of more mischief than would at first be supposed. For they are seldom done entirely, to speak with moderation, by the child itself. Thus the master countenances falsehoods, or winds the poor machine up to some extraordinary exertion that injures the wheels and stops the progress of gradual improvement. The memory is loaded with unintelligible words to make a show of, without the understandings acquiring any distinct ideas. But only that education deserves emphatically to be termed cultivation of mind, which teaches young people how to begin to think. The imagination should not be allowed to debauch the understanding before it gained strength, or vanity will become the forerunner of vice. For every way of exhibiting the acquirements of a child is injurious to its moral character. How much time is lost in teaching them to recite what they do not understand. While seated on benches, all in their best array, the mamas listen with astonishment to the parrot-like prattle uttered in solemn cadences, with all the pomp of ignorance and folly. Such exhibitions only serve to strike the spreading fibres of vanity through the whole mind, for they neither teach children to speak fluently nor behave gracefully. So far from it that these frivolous pursuits might comprehensively be termed the study of affectation, for we now rarely see a simple, bashful boy though few people of taste were ever disgusted by that awkward sheepishness so natural to the age, which schools and an early introduction into society have changed into impudence and apish grimace. Yet how can these things be remedied, whilst schoolmasters depend entirely on parents for a subsistence? And when so many rival schools hang out their lures to catch the attention of vain fathers and mothers, whose parental affection only leads them to wish that their children should outshine those of their neighbours. Without great good luck, a sensible, conscientious man would starve before he could raise a school, if he disdained to bubble weak parents by practising the secret tricks of the craft. In the best regulated schools, however, where swarms are not crammed together, many bad habits must be acquired. But at common schools, the body, heart and understanding are equally stunted, for parents are often only in quest of the cheapest school, and the master could not live if he did not take a much greater number than he could manage himself. Nor will the scanty pittance allowed for each child permit him to hire ushers sufficient to assist in the discharge of the mechanical part of the business. Besides, whatever appearance the house and garden may make, the children do not enjoy the comforts of either, for they are continually reminded by irksome restrictions that they are not at home, and the state rooms, garden, etc., must be kept in order for the recreation of the parents, who of a Sunday visit the school and are impressed by the very parade that renders the situation of their children uncomfortable. With what disgust have I heard sensible women 
for girls are more restrained and cowed than boys, speak of the wearisome confinement which they endured at school. Not allowed, perhaps, to step out of one broad walk in a superb garden, and obliged to pace with steady deportment, stupidly backwards and forwards, holding up their heads and turning out their toes, with shoulders braced back, instead of bounding as nature directs to complete her own design in the various attitudes so conducive to health. The pure animal spirits, which make both mind and body shoot out and unfold the tender blossoms of hope, are turned sour and vented in vain wishes or pert repinings that contract the faculties and spoil the temper, else they mount to the brain and, sharpening the understanding before it gains proportionable strength, produce that pitiful cunning which disgracefully characterises the female mind, and I fear will ever characterise it whilst women remain the slaves of power. The little respect which the male world pay to chastity is, I am persuaded, the grand source of many of the physical and moral evils that torment mankind, as well as of the vices and follies that degrade and destroy women. Yet at school, boys infallibly lose that decent bashfulness which might have ripened into modesty at home. I have already animadverted on the bad habits which females acquire when they are shut up together, and I think that the observation may fairly be extended to the other sex, till the natural inference is drawn, which I have had in view throughout, that to improve both sexes they ought, not only in private families, but in public schools, to be educated together. If marriage be the cement of society, mankind should all be educated after the same model, or the intercourse of the sexes will never deserve the name of fellowship, nor will women ever fulfil the peculiar duties of their sex till they become enlightened citizens, till they become free by being enabled to earn their own subsistence, independent of men, in the same manner, I mean, to prevent misconstruction, as one man is independent of another. Nay, marriage will never be held sacred till women, by being brought up with men, are prepared to be their companions rather than their mistresses, for the mean doublings of cunning will ever render them contemptible, whilst oppression renders them timid. So convinced am I of this truth that I will venture to predict that virtue will never prevail in society till the virtues of both sexes are founded on reason, and till the affection common to both are allowed to gain their due strength by the discharge of mutual duties. Were boys and girls permitted to pursue the same studies together, those graceful decencies might early be inculcated, which produce modesty, without those sexual distinctions that taint the mind. Lessons of politeness and that formulary of decorum which treads on the heels of falsehood would be rendered useless by habitual propriety of behaviour, not indeed put on for visitors like the courtly robe of politeness, but the sober effect of cleanliness of mind. Would not this simple elegance of sincerity be a chaste homage paid to domestic affections, far surpassing the meretricious compliments that shine with false lustre in the heartless intercourse of fashionable life. 
but till more understanding preponderate in society, there will ever be a want of heart and taste, and the harlot's rouge will supply the place of that celestial suffusion which only virtuous affections can give to the face. Gallantry and what is called love may subsist without simplicity of character, but the main pillars of friendship are respect and confidence. Esteem is never founded on it cannot tell what. A taste for the fine arts requires great cultivation, but not more than a taste for the virtuous affections, and both suppose that enlargement of mind which opens so many sources of mental pleasure. Why do people hurry to noisy scenes and crowded circles? I should answer, because they want activity of mind, because they have not cherished the virtues of the heart. They only therefore see and feel in the gross, and continually pine after variety, finding everything that is simple, insipid. This argument may be carried further than philosophers are aware of, for if nature destined woman in particular for the discharge of domestic duties, she made her susceptible of the attached affections in a great degree. Now, women are notoriously fond of pleasure, and naturally must be so, according to my definition, because they cannot enter into the minutiae of domestic taste, lacking judgment, the foundation of all taste. For the understanding, in spite of sensual cavillers, reserves to itself the privilege of conveying pure joy to the heart. With what a languid yawn have I seen an admirable poem thrown down that a man of true taste returns to again and again with rapture. And whilst melody has almost suspended respiration, a lady has asked me where I bought my gown. I have seen also an eye glanced coldly over a most exquisite picture, rest sparkling with pleasure on a caricature rudely sketched. And whilst some terrific feature in nature has spread a sublime stillness through my soul, I have been desired to observe the pretty tricks of a lapdog that my perverse fate forced me to travel with. Is it surprising that such a tasteless being should rather caress this dog than her children, or that she should prefer the rant of flattery to the simple accents of sincerity? To illustrate this remark, I must be allowed to observe that men of the first genius and most cultivated minds have appeared to have the highest relish for the simple beauties of nature, and they must have forcibly felt what they have so well described, the charm which natural affections and unsophisticated feelings spread round the human character. It is this power of looking into the heart and responsively vibrating with each emotion that enables the poet to personify each passion and the painter to sketch with a pencil of fire. True taste is ever the work of the understanding employed in observing natural effects. Until women have more understanding, it is vain to expect them to possess domestic taste. Their lively senses will ever be at work to harden their hearts, and the emotions struck out of them will continue to be vivid and transitory unless a proper education stores their minds with knowledge. It is the want of domestic taste 
and not the acquirement of knowledge that takes women out of their families and tears the smiling babe from the breast that ought to afford it nourishment. Women have been allowed to remain in ignorance and slavish dependence many, very many years, and still we hear of nothing but their fondness of pleasure and sway, their preference of rakes and soldiers, their childish attachment to toys and the vanity that makes them value accomplishments more than virtues. History brings forward a fearful catalogue of the crimes which their cunning has produced. When the weak slaves have had sufficient address to overreach their masters, in France and in how many other countries have men been the luxurious despots and women the crafty ministers? Does this prove that ignorance and dependence domesticate them? Is not their folly the byword of the libertines who relax in their society? And do not men of sense continually lament that an immoderate fondness for dress and dissipation carries the mother of a family forever from home? Their hearts have not been debauched by knowledge, nor their minds led astray by scientific pursuits. Yet they do not fulfil the peculiar duties which, as women, they are called upon by nature to fulfil. On the contrary, the state of warfare which subsists between the sexes makes them employ those wiles that frustrate the more open designs of force. When, therefore, I call women slaves, I mean in a political and civil sense, for indirectly they obtain too much power and are debased by their exertions to obtain illicit sway. Let an enlightened nation, then, try what effect reason would have to bring them back to nature and their duty, and allowing them to share the advantages of education and government with man, see whether they will become better as they grow wiser and become free. They cannot be injured by the experiment, for it is not in the power of man to render them more insignificant than they are at present. To render this practicable, day schools for particular ages should be established by government in which boys and girls might be educated together. The school for the younger children, from five to nine years of age, ought to be absolutely free and open to all classes. A sufficient number of masters should also be chosen by a select committee in each parish, to whom any complaint of negligence, etc., might be made, if signed by six of the children's parents. Ushers would then be unnecessary, for I believe experience will ever prove that this kind of subordinate authority is particularly injurious to the morals of youth. What indeed can tend to deprave the character more than outward submission and inward contempt? Yet how can boys be expected to treat an usher with respect when the master seems to consider him in the light of a servant and almost to countenance the ridicule which becomes the chief amusement of the boys during the play hours. But nothing of this kind could occur in an elementary day school, where boys and girls, the rich and poor, should meet together. And to prevent any of the distinctions of vanity, they should be dressed alike and all obliged to submit to the same discipline, or leave the school. The schoolroom ought to be surrounded by a large piece of ground in which the children might be usefully exercised, for at this age they should not be confined to any sedentary employment for more than an hour at a time. 
that these relaxations might all be rendered a part of elementary education, for many things improve and amuse the senses when introduced as a kind of show, to the principles of which, dryly laid down, children would turn a deaf ear. For instance, botany, mechanics, and astronomy, reading, writing, arithmetic, natural history, and some simple experiments in natural philosophy might fill up the day. But these pursuits should never encroach on gymnastic plays in the open air. The elements of religion, history, the history of man and politics might also be taught by conversations in the Socratic form. After the age of nine, girls and boys intended for domestic employments or mechanical trades ought to be removed to other schools and receive instruction in some measure appropriated to the destination of each individual, the two sexes being still together in the morning. But in the afternoon, the girls should attend a school where plain work, mantua-making, millinery, etc., would be their employment. The young people of superior abilities or fortune might now be taught in another school the dead and living languages, the elements of science, and continue the study of history and politics on a more extensive scale, which would not exclude polite literature. Girls and boys still together, I hear some readers ask. Yes, and I should not fear any other consequence than that some early attachment might take place, which, whilst it had the best effect on the moral character of the young people, might not perfectly agree with the views of the parents, for it will be a long time, I fear, before the world is so enlightened that parents, only anxious to render their children virtuous, will let them choose companions for life themselves. Besides, this would be a sure way to promote early marriages, and from early marriages the most salutary physical and moral effects naturally flow. What a different character does a married citizen assume from the selfish coxcomb who lives but for himself, and who is often afraid to marry, lest he should not be able to live in a certain style. Great emergencies accepted, which would rarely occur in a society of which equality was the basis. A man could only be prepared to discharge the duties of public life by the habitual practice of those inferior ones which form the man. In this plan of education, the constitution of boys would not be ruined by the early debaucheries which now make men so selfish, nor girls rendered weak and vain by indolence and frivolous pursuits. But I presuppose that such a degree of equality should be established between the sexes as would shut out gallantry and coquetry, yet allow friendship and love to temper the heart for the discharge of higher duties. These would be schools of morality, and the happiness of man allowed to flow from the pure springs of duty and affection. What advances might not the human mind make? Society can only be happy and free in proportion as it is virtuous. But the present distinctions established in society corrode all private and blast all public virtue. I have already inveighed against the custom of confining girls to their needle and shutting them out from all political and civil employments, for by thus narrowing their minds they are rendered unfit to fulfil the peculiar duties which nature has assigned them only employed about the little incidents of the day 
they necessarily grow up cunning. My very soul has often sickened at observing the sly tricks practised by women to gain some foolish thing on which their silly hearts were set. Not allowed to dispose of money or call anything their own, they learn to turn the market penny. Or should a husband offend by staying from home or give rise to some emotions of jealousy, a new gown or any pretty bauble smooths Juno's angry brow. But these littlenesses would not degrade their character if women were led to respect themselves, if political and moral subjects were open to them. And I will venture to affirm that this is the only way to make them properly attentive to their domestic duties. An active mind embraces the whole circle of its duties and finds time enough for all. It is not, I assert, a bold attempt to emulate masculine virtues. It is not the enchantment of literary pursuits or the steady investigation of scientific subjects that lead women astray from duty. No. It is indolence and vanity, the love of pleasure and the love of sway that will reign paramount in an empty mind. I say empty emphatically because the education which women now receive scarcely deserves the name. For the little knowledge they are led to acquire during the important years of youth is merely relative to accomplishments and accomplishments without a bottom, for unless the understanding be cultivated, superficial and monotonous is every grace. Like the charms of a made-up face, they only strike the senses in a crowd, but at home, wanting mind, they want variety. The consequence is obvious. In gay scenes of dissipation, we meet the artificial mind and face. For those who fly from solitude dread, next to solitude, the domestic circle. Not having it in their power to amuse or interest, they feel their own insignificance, or find nothing to amuse or interest themselves. Besides, what can be more indelicate than a girl's coming out in the fashionable world, which, in other words, is to bring to market a marriageable miss, whose person is taken from one public place to another richly caparisoned. Yet, mixing in the giddy circle under restraint, these butterflies long to flutter at large, for the first affection of their souls is their own persons, to which their attention has been called with the most sedulous care whilst they were preparing for the period that decides their fate for life. Instead of pursuing this idle routine, sighing for tasteless show and heartless state, with what dignity would the youths of both sexes form attachments in the schools that I have cursorily pointed out, in which, as life advanced, dancing, music, and drawing might be admitted as relaxations, for at these schools young people of fortune ought to remain more or less till they were of age. Those who were designed for particular professions might attend three or four mornings in the week, the schools appropriated for their immediate instruction. I only drop these observations at present as hints, rather indeed as an outline of the plan I mean than a digested one. But I must add that I highly approve of one regulation mentioned in the pamphlet already alluded to, the Bishop of Autun, that of making the children and youths independent of the masters, respecting punishments. They should be tried by their peers, 
which would be an admirable method of fixing sound principles of justice in the mind, and might have the happiest effect on the temper, which is very early soured or irritated by tyranny, till it becomes peevishly cunning or ferociously overbearing. My imagination darts forward with benevolent fervour to greet these amiable and respectable groups, in spite of the sneering of cold hearts, who are at liberty to utter with frigid self-importance the damning epithet romantic, the force of which I shall endeavour to blunt by repeating the words of an eloquent moralist. I know not whether the illusions of a truly humane heart, whose zeal renders everything easy, is not preferable to that rough and repulsing reason, which always finds in indifference for the public good the first obstacle to whatever would promote it. I know that libertines will also exclaim that woman would be unsexed by acquiring strength of body and mind, and that beauty, soft, bewitching beauty, would no longer adorn the daughters of men. I am of a very different opinion, for I think that on the contrary we should then see dignified beauty and true grace, to produce which many powerful physical and moral causes would concur. Not relaxed beauty, it is true, nor the graces of helplessness, but such as appears to make us respect the human body as a majestic pile fit to receive a noble inhabitant in the relics of antiquity. I do not forget the popular opinion that the Grecian statues were not modelled after nature. I mean, not according to the proportions of a particular man, but that beautiful limbs and features were selected from various bodies to form an harmonious whole. This might, in some degree, be true. The fine ideal picture of an exalted imagination might be superior to the materials which the painter found in nature, and thus it might, with propriety, be termed rather the model of mankind than of a man. It was not, however, the mechanical selection of limbs and features, but the ebullition of an heated fancy that burst forth, and the fine senses and enlarged understanding of the artist selected the solid matter which he drew into this glowing focus. I observed that it was not mechanical because a whole was produced, a model of that grand simplicity of those concurring energies which arrest our attention and command our reverence. For only insipid, lifeless beauty is produced by a servile copy of even beautiful nature. Yet independent of these observations, I believe that the human form must have been far more beautiful than it is at present, because extreme indolence, barbarous ligatures and many causes which forcibly act on it in our luxurious state of society, did not retard its expansion or render it deformed. Exercise and cleanliness appear to be not only the surest means of preserving health, but of promoting beauty, the physical causes only considered. Yet this is not sufficient. Moral ones must concur, or beauty will be merely of that rustic kind which blooms on the innocent, wholesome countenances of some country people, whose minds have not been exercised. To render the person perfect, physical and moral beauty ought to be attained at the same time, each lending and receiving force 
by the combination. Judgment must reside on the brow, affection and fancy beam in the eye, and humanity curve the cheek. Or vain is the sparkling of the finest eye, or the elegantly turned finish of the fairest features, whilst in every motion that displays the active limbs and well-knit joints, grace and modesty should appear. But this fair assemblage is not to be brought together by chance. It is the reward of exertions met to support each other, for judgment can only be acquired by reflection, affection by the discharge of duties, and humanity by the exercise of compassion to every living creature. Humanity to animals should be particularly inculcated as a part of national education, for it is not at present one of our national virtues. Tenderness for their humble, dumb domestics amongst the lower class is oftener to be found in a savage than a civilized state. For civilization prevents that intercourse which creates affection in the rude hut or mud cabin, and leads uncultivated minds who are only depraved by the refinements which prevail in the society, where they are trodden underfoot by the rich, to domineer over them, to revenge the insults that they are obliged to bear from their superiors. This habitual cruelty is first caught at school, where it is one of the rare sports of the boys to torment the miserable brutes that fall in their way. The transition as they grow up from barbarity to brutes to domestic tyranny over wives, children and servants is very easy. Justice or even benevolence will not be a powerful spring of action unless it extend to the whole creation. Nay, I believe that it may be delivered as an axiom that those who can see pain unmoved will soon learn to inflict it. The vulgar are swayed by present feelings and the habits which they have accidentally acquired. But on partial feelings, much dependence cannot be placed, though they be just. For when they are not invigorated by reflection, custom weakens them till they are scarcely felt. The sympathies of our nature are strengthened by pondering cogitations and deadened by thoughtless use. Macbeth's heart smote him more for one murder, the first, than for a hundred subsequent ones which were necessary to back it. But when I use the epithet vulgar, I did not mean to confine my remark to the poor, for partial humanity founded on present sensations or whim is quite as conspicuous, if not more so, amongst the rich. The lady who sheds tears for the bird starved in a snare and execrates the devils in the shape of men, who goad to madness the poor ox or whip the patient ass tottering under a burden above its strength, will nevertheless keep her coachman and horses whole hours waiting for her. When the sharp frost bites, or the rain beats against the well-closed windows which do not admit a breath of air to tell her how roughly the wind blows without. And she who takes her dogs to bed and nurses them with a parade of sensibility when sick will suffer her babes to grow up crooked in a nursery. This illustration of my argument is drawn from a matter of fact. The woman whom I allude to was handsome, reckoned very handsome, by those who do not miss the mind when the face is plump and fair.
but her understanding had not been led from female duties by literature, nor her innocence debauched by knowledge. No, she was quite feminine, according to the masculine acceptation of the word. And so far from loving these spoiled brutes that filled the place which her children ought to have occupied, she only lisped out a pretty mixture of French and English nonsense to please the men who flocked round her. The wife, mother, and human creature were all swallowed up by the factitious character which an improper education and the selfish vanity of beauty had produced. I do not like to make a distinction without a difference, and I own that I have been as much disgusted by the fine lady who took her lapdog to her bosom instead of her child, as by the ferocity of a man who, beating his horse, declared that he knew as well when he did wrong as a Christian. This brood of folly shows how mistaken they are who, if they allow women to leave their harems, do not cultivate their understanding in order to plant virtues in their hearts. For had they sense, they might acquire that domestic taste which would lead them to love with reasonable subordination their whole family, from the husband to the house-dog. Nor would they ever insult humanity in the person of the most menial servant, by paying more attention to the comfort of a brute than to that of a fellow-creature. My observations on national education are obviously hints, but I principally wish to enforce the necessity of educating the sexes together to perfect both, and of making children sleep at home that they may learn to love home. Yet, to make private support instead of smothering public affections, they should be sent to school to mix with a number of equals, for only by the jostlings of equality can we form a just opinion of ourselves. To render mankind more virtuous and happier, of course, both sexes must act from the same principle. But how can that be expected when only one is allowed to see the reasonableness of it? To render also the social compact truly equitable, and in order to spread those enlightening principles which alone can meliorate the fate of man, women must be allowed to found their virtue on knowledge, which is scarcely possible unless they be educated by the same pursuits as men. For they are now made so inferior by ignorance and low desires as not to deserve to be ranked with them, or by the serpentine wrigglings of cunning they mount the tree of knowledge and only acquire sufficient to lead men astray. It is plain from the history of all nations that women cannot be confined to merely domestic pursuits, for they will not fulfil family duties unless their minds take a wider range, and whilst they are kept in ignorance, they become in the same proportion the slaves of pleasure as they are the slaves of man nor can they be shut out of great enterprises, though the narrowness of their minds often make them mar what they are unable to comprehend. The libertinism and even the virtues of superior men will always give women of some description great power over them, and these weak women, under the influence of childish passions and selfish vanity, will throw a false light over the objects which the very men view with their eyes. 
who ought to enlighten their judgment. Men of fancy and those sanguine characters who mostly hold the helm of human affairs in general relax in the society of women. And surely I need not cite to the most superficial reader of history the numerous examples of vice and oppression which the private intrigues of female favourites have produced. Not to dwell on the mischief that naturally arises from the blundering interposition of well-meaning folly. For in the transactions of business, it is much better to have to deal with a knave than a fool, because a knave adheres to some plan, and any plan of reason may be seen through much sooner than a sudden flight of folly. The power which vile and foolish women have had over wise men who possessed sensibility is notorious. I shall only mention one instance. Whoever drew a more exalted female character than Rousseau, though in the lump, he constantly endeavoured to degrade the sex. And why was he thus anxious? truly to justify to himself the affection which weakness and virtue had made him cherish for that fool Teresa. He could not raise her to the common level of her sex, and therefore he laboured to bring woman down to hers. He found her a convenient, humble companion, and pride made him determine to find some superior virtues in the being whom he chose to live with. But did not her conduct during his life and after his death clearly show how grossly he was mistaken who called her a celestial innocent? Nay, in the bitterness of his heart he himself laments that when his bodily infirmities made him no longer treat her like a woman, she ceased to have an affection for him. And it was very natural that she should, for having so few sentiments in common, when the sexual tie was broken, what was to hold her? To hold her affection, whose sensibility was confined to one sex, nay, to one man, it requires sense to turn sensibility into the broad channel of humanity. Many women have not mind enough to have an affection for a woman or a friendship for a man. But the sexual weakness that makes woman depend on man for a subsistence produces a kind of cattish affection which leads a wife to purr about her husband as she would about any man who fed and caressed her. Men are, however, often gratified by this kind of fondness, which is confined in a beastly manner to themselves. But should they ever become more virtuous, they will wish to converse at their fireside with a friend after they cease to play with a mistress. Besides, understanding is necessary to give variety and interest to sensual enjoyments, for lo, indeed, in the intellectual scale is the mind that can continue to love when neither virtue nor sense give a human appearance to an animal appetite. But sense will always preponderate, and if women are not, in general, brought more on a level with men, some superior women, like the Greek courtesans, will assemble the men of abilities around them, and draw from their families many citizens who would have stayed at home had their wives had more sense or the graces which result from the exercise of the understanding and fancy, the legitimate parents of taste. A woman of talents, if she be not absolutely ugly, will always obtain great power raised 
by the weakness of her sex, and in proportion as men acquire virtue and delicacy, by the exertion of reason they will look for both in women, but they can only acquire them in the same way that men do. In France or Italy, have the women confined themselves to domestic life? Though they have not hitherto had a political existence, yet have they not illicitly had great sway, corrupting themselves and the men with whose passions they played? In short, in whatever light I view the subject, reason and experience convince me that the only method of leading women to fulfil their peculiar duties is to free them from all restraint by allowing them to participate the inherent rights of mankind. Make them free and they will quickly become wise and virtuous as men become more so, for the improvement must be mutual or the justice which one half of the human race are obliged to submit to, retorting on their oppressors, the virtue of man will be worm-eaten by the insect whom he keeps under his feet. Let men take their choice. Man and woman were made for each other, though not to become one being. And if they will not improve women they will deprave them. I speak of the improvement and emancipation of the whole sex, for I know that the behaviour of a few women who by accident or following a strong bent of nature have acquired a portion of knowledge superior to that of the rest of their sex has often been overbearing. But there have been instances of women who attaining knowledge have not discarded modesty, nor have they always pedantically appeared to despise the ignorance which they laboured to disperse in their own minds. The exclamations, then, which any advice respecting female learning commonly produces, especially from pretty women, often arise from envy when they chance to see that even the lustre of their eyes and the flippant sportiveness of refined coquetry will not always secure them attention during a whole evening, should a woman of a more cultivated understanding endeavour to give a rational turn to the conversation, the common source of consolation is that such women seldom get Husbands, what arts have I not seen silly women use to interrupt by flirtation, a very significant word to describe such a manoeuvre, a rational conversation which made the men forget that they were pretty women. But allowing what is very natural to man, that the possession of rare abilities is really calculated to excite overweening pride, disgusting in both men and women, in what a state of inferiority must the female faculties have rusted when such a small portion of knowledge as those women attained who have sneeringly been termed learned women could be singular? sufficiently so to puff up the possessor and excite envy in her contemporaries and some of the other sex. Nay, has not a little rationality exposed many women to the severest censure? I advert to well-known facts, for I have frequently heard women ridiculed and every little weakness exposed only because they adopted the advice of some medical men and deviated from the beaten track in their mode of treating their infants. I have actually heard this barbarous aversion to innovation carried still further 
and a sensible woman stigmatized as an unnatural mother who has thus been wisely solicitous to preserve the health of her children when in the midst of her care she has lost one by some of the casualties of infancy which no prudence can ward off her acquaintance have observed that this was the consequence of new-fangled notions the new-fangled notions of ease and cleanliness and those who pretending to experience though they have long adhered to prejudices that have according to the opinion of the most sagacious physicians thinned the human race almost rejoiced at the disaster that gave a kind of sanction to prescription indeed if it were only on this account the national education of women is of the utmost consequence for what a number of human sacrifices are made to that moloch prejudice and in how many ways are children destroyed by the lasciviousness of man the want of natural affection in many women who are drawn from their duty by the admiration of men and the ignorance of others render the infancy of man a much more perilous state than that of brutes yet men are unwilling to place women in situations proper to enable them to acquire sufficient understanding to know how even to nurse their babes so forcibly does this truth strike me that i would rest the whole tendency of my reasoning upon it for whatever tends to incapacitate the maternal character takes woman out of her sphere but it is vain to expect the present race of weak mothers either to take that reasonable care of a child's body which is necessary to lay the foundation of a good constitution supposing that it do not suffer for the sins of its fathers or to manage its temper so judiciously that the child will not have as it grows up to throw off all that its mother its first instructor directly or indirectly taught and unless the mind have uncommon vigour womanish follies will stick to the character throughout life the weakness of the mother will be visited on the children and whilst women are educated to rely on their husbands for judgment this must ever be the consequence for there is no improving an understanding by halves nor can any being act wisely from imitation because in every circumstance of life there is a kind of individuality which requires an exertion of judgment to modify general rules the being who can think justly in one track will soon extend its intellectual empire and she who has sufficient judgment to manage her children will not submit right or wrong to her husband or patiently to the social laws which makes a nonentity of a wife in public schools women to guard against the errors of ignorance should be taught the elements of anatomy and medicine not only to enable them to take proper care of their own health but to make them rational nurses of their infants parents and husbands for the bills of mortality are swelled by the blunders of self-willed old women who give nostrums of their own without knowing anything of the human frame it is likewise proper only in a domestic view to make women acquainted with the anatomy of the mind by allowing the sexes to associate together in every pursuit and by leading them to observe the progress of the human understanding in the improvement of the sciences and arts never forgetting the science of morality 
nor the study of the political history of mankind. A man has been termed a microcosm, and every family might also be called a state. States, it is true, have mostly been governed by arts that disgrace the character of man, and the want of a just constitution and equal laws have so perplexed the notions of the worldly wise that they more than question the reasonableness of contending for the rights of humanity. Thus, morality, polluted in the national reservoir, sends off streams of vice to corrupt the constituent parts of the body politic. But should more noble, or rather more just principles, regulate the laws which ought to be the government of society, and not those who execute them, duty might become the rule of private conduct. Besides, by the exercise of their bodies and minds, women would acquire that mental activity so necessary in the maternal character, united with the fortitude that distinguishes steadiness of conduct from the obstinate perverseness of weakness. For it is dangerous to advise the indolent to be steady, because they instantly become rigorous, and to save themselves trouble, punish with severity faults that the patient fortitude of reason might have prevented. But fortitude presupposes strength of mind, and is strength of mind to be acquired by indolent acquiescence, by asking advice instead of exerting the judgment, by obeying through fear instead of practising the forbearance which we all stand in need of ourselves. The conclusion which I wish to draw is obvious. Make women rational creatures and free citizens, and they will quickly become good wives and mothers. That is, if men do not neglect the duties of husbands and fathers. Discussing the advantages which a public and private education combined, as I have sketched, might rationally be expected to produce, I have dwelt most on such as are particularly relative to the female world, because I think the female world oppressed. Yet the gangrene which the vices engendered by oppression have produced is not confined to the morbid part, but pervades society at large. So that when I wish to see my sex become more like moral agents, my heart bounds with the anticipation of the general diffusion of that sublime contentment which only morality can diffuse. Chapter 13 Some Instances of the Folly Which the Ignorance of Women Generates With Concluding Reflections on the Moral Improvement That a Revolution in Female Manners Might Naturally Be Expected to Produce. There are many follies, in some degree peculiar to women, sins against reason of commission as well as of omission. But all flowing from ignorance or prejudice, I shall only point out such as appear to be injurious to their moral character. And, in animadverting on them, I wish especially to prove that the weakness of mind and body which men have endeavoured by various motives to perpetuate, prevents their discharging the peculiar duty of their sex. For when weakness of body will not permit them to suckle their children, and weakness of mind makes them spoil their tempers, is woman in a natural state. Section 13.1 one glaring instance of the weakness which proceeds from ignorance first claims attention and calls for severe reproof. In this metropolis, a number of lurking leeches infamously gain a subsistence by practising on the credulity of women, 
pretending to cast nativities, to use the technical phrase. And many females, who proud of their rank and fortune, look down on the vulgar with sovereign contempt, show by this credulity that the distinction is arbitrary, and that they have not sufficiently cultivated their minds to rise above vulgar prejudices. Women, because they have not been led to consider the knowledge of their duty as the one thing necessary to know, or to live in the present moment by the discharge of it, are very anxious to peep into futurity, to learn what they have to expect to render life interesting and to break the vacuum of ignorance. I must be allowed to expostulate seriously with the ladies who follow these idle inventions. For ladies, mistresses of families, are not ashamed to drive in their own carriages to the door of the cunning man, and if any of them should peruse this work, I entreat them to answer to their own hearts the following questions, not forgetting that they are in the presence of God. Do you believe that there is but one God, and that he is powerful, wise, and good? Do you believe that all things were created by him, and that all beings are dependent on him? Do you rely on his wisdom so conspicuous in his works, and in your own frame, and are you convinced that he has ordered all things which do not come under the cognizance of your senses in the same perfect harmony to fulfil his designs? Do you acknowledge that the power of looking into futurity and seeing things that are not as if they were is an attribute of the Creator? And should he, by an impression on the minds of his creatures, think fit to impart to them some event hid in the shades of time, yet unborn, to whom would the secret be revealed by immediate inspiration? The opinion of ages will answer this question. To reverent old men, to people distinguished for eminent piety, the oracles of old were thus delivered by priests dedicated to the service of the God who was supposed to inspire them. The glare of worldly pomp which surrounded these impostors and the respect paid to them by artful politicians who knew how to avail themselves of this useful engine to bend the necks of the strong under the dominion of the cunning spread a sacred mysterious veil of sanctity over their lies and abominations. Impressed by such solemn devotional parade, a Greek or Roman lady might be excused if she inquired of the oracle when she was anxious to pry into futurity or inquire about some dubious event. And her inquiries, however contrary to reason, could not be reckoned impious. But can the professors of Christianity ward off that imputation? Can a Christian suppose that the favourites of the Most High, the highly favoured, would be obliged to lurk in disguise and practise the most dishonest tricks to cheat silly women out of the money which the poor cry for in vain. Say not that such questions are an insult to common sense, for it is your own conduct, O oh ye foolish women, which throws an odium on your sex. And these reflections should make you shudder at your thoughtlessness and irrational devotion, for I do not suppose that all of you laid aside your religion, such as it is, when you entered those mysterious dwellings. Yet, as I have throughout supposed myself talking to ignorant women, for ignorant ye are in the most emphatical sense of the word, 
It would be absurd to reason with you on the egregious folly of desiring to know what the supreme wisdom has concealed. Probably you would not understand me were I to attempt to show you that it would be absolutely inconsistent with the grand purpose of life, that of rendering human creatures wise and virtuous, and that were it sanctioned by God, it would disturb the order established in creation. And if it be not sanctioned by God, do you expect to hear truth? Can events be foretold, events which have not yet assumed a body to become subject to mortal inspection, can they be foreseen by a vicious worldling who pampers his appetites by preying on the foolish ones? Perhaps, however, you devoutly believe in the devil and imagine, to shift the question, that he may assist his votaries. But if really respecting the power of such a being, an enemy to goodness and to God, can you go to church after having been under such an obligation to him? From these delusions to those still more fashionable deceptions practised by the whole tribe of magnetizers, the transition is very natural. With respect to them, it is equally proper to ask women a few questions. Do you know anything of the construction of the human frame? If not, it is proper that you should be told what every child ought to know, that when its admirable economy has been disturbed by intemperance or indolence, I speak not of violent disorders, but of chronical diseases, it must be brought into a healthy state again by slow degrees. And if the functions of life have not been materially injured, regimen, another word for temperance, air, exercise, and a few medicines prescribed by persons who have studied the human body are the only human means yet discovered of recovering that inestimable blessing, health, that will bear investigation. Do you then believe that these magnetizers, who by hocus-pocus tricks pretend to work a miracle, are delegated by God, or assisted by the solver of all these kind of difficulties, the devil? Do they, when they put to flight, as it is said, disorders that have baffled the powers of medicine, work in conformity to the light of reason? Or do they effect these wonderful cures by supernatural aid? By a communication, an adept may answer, with the world of spirits. A noble privilege, it must be allowed. Some of the ancients mention familiar demons who guarded them from danger by kindly intimating, we cannot guess in what manner, when any danger was nigh, or pointed out what they ought to undertake. Yet the men who laid claim to this privilege, out of the order of nature, insisted that it was the reward or consequence of superior temperance and piety. But the present workers of wonders are not raised above their fellows by superior temperance or sanctity. They do not cure for the love of God, but money. These are the priests of quackery, though it be true they have not the convenient expedient of selling masses for souls in purgatory, nor churches where they can display crutches and models of limbs made sound by a touch or a word. I am not conversant with the technical terms, nor initiated into the arcana, therefore I may speak improperly, but it is clear that men who will not conform to the law of reason and earn a subsistence in an honest way by degrees are very fortunate in becoming acquainted with such obliging spirits.
we cannot indeed give them credit for either great sagacity or goodness else they would have chosen more noble instruments when they wished to show themselves the benevolent friends of man it is however little short of blasphemy to pretend to such power from the whole tenor of the dispensations of providence it appears evident to sober reason that certain vices produce certain effects and can any one so grossly insult the wisdom of god as to suppose that a miracle will be allowed to disturb his general laws to restore to health the intemperate and vicious merely to enable them to pursue the same course with impunity be whole and sin no more said jesus and are greater miracles to be performed by those who do not follow his footsteps who healed the body to reach the mind the mentioning of the name of christ after such vile impostors may displease some of my readers i respect their warmth but let them not forget that the followers of these delusions bear his name and profess to be the disciples of him who said by their works we should know who were the children of god or the servants of sin i allow that it is easier to touch the body of a saint or to be magnetized than to restrain our appetites or govern our passions but health of body or mind can only be recovered by these means or we make the supreme judge partial and revengeful is he a man that he should change or punish out of resentment he the common father wounds but to heal says reason and our irregularities producing certain consequences we are forcibly shown the nature of vice that thus learning to know good from evil by experience we may hate one and love the other in proportion to the wisdom which we attain the poison contains the antidote and we either reform our evil habits and cease to sin against our own bodies to use the forcible language of scripture or a premature death the punishment of sin snaps the thread of life here an awful stop is put to our inquiries but why should i conceal my sentiments considering the attributes of god i believe that whatever punishment may follow will tend like the anguish of disease to show the malignity of vice for the purpose of reformation positive punishment appears so contrary to the nature of god discoverable in all his works and in our own reason that i could sooner believe that the deity paid no attention to the conduct of men than that he punished without the benevolent design of reforming to suppose only that an all-wise and powerful being as good as he is great should create a being foreseeing that after fifty or sixty years of feverish existence it would be plunged into never-ending woe is blasphemy on what will the worm feed that is never to die on folly on ignorance say ye i should blush indignantly at drawing the natural conclusion could i insert it and wish to withdraw myself from the wing of my god on such a supposition i speak with reverence he would be a consuming fire we should wish though vainly to fly from his presence when fear absorbed love and darkness involved all his counsels i know that many devout people boast of submitting to the will of god blindly 
as to an arbitrary scepter or rod, on the same principle as the Indians worship the devil. In other words, like people in the common concerns of life, they do homage to power and cringe under the foot that can crush them. Rational religion, on the contrary, is a submission to the will of a being so perfectly wise that all he wills must be directed by the proper motive, must be reasonable. And if thus we respect God, can we give credit to the mysterious insinuations which insult his laws? Can we believe, though it should stare us in the face, that he would work a miracle to authorize confusion by sanctioning an error? Yet we must either allow these impious conclusions or treat with contempt every promise to restore health to a diseased body by supernatural means or to foretell the incidents that can only be foreseen by God. Section 13.2 Another instance of that feminine weakness of character often produced by a confined education is a romantic twist of the mind which has been very properly termed sentimental. Women, subjected by ignorance to their sensations and only taught to look for happiness in love, refine on sensual feelings and adopt metaphysical notions respecting that passion which lead them shamefully to neglect the duties of life and frequently, in the midst of these sublime refinements, they plunge into actual vice. These are the women who are amused by the reveries of the stupid novelists, who, knowing little of human nature, work up stale tales and describe meretricious scenes, all retailed in a sentimental jargon which equally tend to corrupt the taste and draw the heart aside from its daily duties. I do not mention the understanding, because never having been exercised, its slumbering energies rest inactive, like the lurking particles of fire which are supposed universally to pervade matter. Females, in fact, denied all political privileges and not allowed as married women excepting in criminal cases a civil existence have their attention naturally drawn from the interest of the whole community to that of the minute parts though the private duty of any member of society must be very imperfectly performed when not connected with the general good. The mighty business of female life is to please, and restrained from entering into more important concerns by political and civil oppression, sentiments become events, and reflection deepens what it should and would have effaced if the understanding had been allowed to take a wider range. But, confined to trifling employments, they naturally imbibe opinions which the only kind of reading calculated to interest an innocent, frivolous mind inspires. Unable to grasp anything great, is it surprising that they find the reading of history a very dry task, and disquisitions addressed to the understanding intolerably tedious and almost unintelligible. Thus are they necessarily dependent on the novelist for amusement. Yet when I exclaim against novels, I mean when contrasted with those works which exercise the understanding and regulate the imagination. For any kind of reading, I think better than leaving a blank still a blank, 
because the mind must receive a degree of enlargement and obtain a little strength by a slight exertion of its thinking powers. Besides, even the productions that are only addressed to the imagination raise the reader a little above the gross gratification of appetites to which the mind has not given a shade of delicacy. This observation is the result of experience, for I have known several notable women, and one in particular who was a very good woman, as good as such a narrow mind would allow her to be, who took care that her daughters, three in number, should never see a novel. As she was a woman of fortune and fashion, they had various masters to attend them, and a sort of menial governess to watch their footsteps. From their masters, they learned how tables, chairs, etc., were called in French and Italian. But as the few books thrown in their way were far above their capacities or devotional, they neither acquired ideas nor sentiments, and passed their time when not compelled to repeat words in dressing, quarrelling with each other, or conversing with their maids by stealth, till they were brought into company as marriageable. Their mother, a widow, was busy in the meantime in keeping up her connections, as she termed a numerous acquaintance, lest her girls should want a proper introduction into the great world. And these young ladies, with minds vulgar in every sense of the word, and spoiled tempers, entered life puffed up with notions of their own consequence, and looking down with contempt on those who could not vie with them in dress and parade. With respect to love, nature or their nurses had taken care to teach them the physical meaning of the word, and as they had few topics of conversation and fewer refinements of sentiment, they expressed their gross wishes not in very delicate phrases when they spoke freely talking of matrimony. Could these girls have been injured by the perusal of novels? I almost forgot a shade in the character of one of them. She affected a simplicity bordering on folly, and with a simper would utter the most immodest remarks and questions, the full meaning of which she had learned whilst secluded from the world, and afraid to speak in her mother's presence, who governed with a high hand. They were all educated, as she prided herself, in a most exemplary manner, and read their chapters and psalms before breakfast, never touching a silly novel. This is only one instance, but I recollect many other women who, not led by degrees to proper studies, and not permitted to choose for themselves, have indeed been overgrown children, or have obtained by mixing in the world a little of what is termed common sense, that is, a distinct manner of seeing common occurrences as they stand detached. But what deserves the name of intellect, the power of gaining general or abstract ideas, or even intermediate ones, was out of the question. Their minds were quiescent, and when they were not roused by sensible objects and employments of that kind, they were low-spirited, would cry, or go to sleep. When, therefore, I advise my sex not to read such flimsy works, it is to induce them to read something superior, for I coincide in opinion with a sagacious man who, having a daughter and niece under his care, pursued a very different plan with each. The niece, who had considerable abilities, had, before she was left to his guardianship, 
been indulged in desultory reading. Her he endeavoured to lead, and did lead, to history and moral essays. But his daughter, whom a fond, weak mother had indulged, and who consequently was averse to everything like application, he allowed to read novels, and used to justify his conduct by saying that if she ever attained a relish for reading them, he should have some foundation to work upon, and that erroneous opinions were better than none at all. In fact, the female mind has been so totally neglected that knowledge was only to be acquired from this muddy source, till from reading novels some women of superior talents learned to despise them. The best method, I believe, that can be adopted to correct a fondness for novels is to ridicule them, not indiscriminately, for then it would have little effect. But if a judicious person, with some turn for humour, would read several to a young girl, and point out, both by tones and apt comparisons with pathetic incidents and heroic characters in history, how foolishly and ridiculously they caricatured human nature. Just opinions might be substituted instead of romantic sentiments. In one respect, however, the majority of both sexes resemble and equally show a want of taste and modesty. Ignorant women, forced to be chaste to preserve their reputation, allow their imagination to revel in the unnatural and meretricious scenes sketched by the novel writers of the day, slighting as insipid the sober dignity and matronly grace of history whilst men carry the same vitiated taste into life and fly for amusement to the wanton from the unsophisticated charms of virtue and the grave respectability of sense. Besides, the reading of novels makes women, and particularly ladies of fashion, very fond of using strong expressions and superlatives in conversation. And though the dissipated artificial life which they lead prevents their cherishing any strong legitimate passion, the language of passion in affected tones slips forever from their glib tongues, and every trifle produces those phosphoric bursts which only mimic in the dark the flame of passion. Section 13.3 Ignorance and the mistaken cunning that nature sharpens in weak heads as a principle of self-preservation render women very fond of dress and produce all the vanity which such a fondness may naturally be expected to generate, to the exclusion of emulation and magnanimity. I agree with Rousseau that the physical part of the art of pleasing consists in ornaments, and for that very reason I should guard girls against the contagious fondness for dress so common to weak women, that they may not rest in the physical part. Yet weak are the women who imagine that they can long please without the aid of the mind, or, in other words, without the moral art of pleasing. But the moral art, if it be not a profanation to use the word art, when alluding to the grace which is an effect of virtue, and not the motive of action, is never to be found with ignorance. The sportiveness of innocence, so pleasing to refined libertines of both sexes, is widely different in its essence from this superior gracefulness. A strong inclination for external ornaments 
ever appears in barbarous states. Only the men, not the women, adorn themselves. For where women are allowed to be so far on a level with men, society has advanced at least one step in civilization. The attention to dress, therefore, which has been thought a sexual propensity, I think natural to mankind. But I ought to express myself with more precision. When the mind is not sufficiently open to take pleasure in reflection, the body will be adorned with sedulous care, and ambition will appear in tattooing or painting it. So far is the first inclination carried that even the hellish yoke of slavery cannot stifle the savage desire of admiration which the black heroes inherit from both their parents, for all the hardly earned savings of a slave are commonly expended in a little tawdry finery. And I have seldom known a good male or female servant that was not particularly fond of dress. Their clothes were their riches, and I argue from analogy that the fondness for dress so extravagant in females arises from the same cause, want of cultivation of mind. When men meet, they converse about business, politics, or literature. But, says Swift, how naturally do women apply their hands to each other's lappets and ruffles? And very natural it is, for they have not any business to interest them, have not a taste for literature, and they find politics dry, because they have not acquired a love for mankind by turning their thoughts to the grand pursuits that exalt the human race and promote general happiness. Besides, various are the paths to power and fame, which by accident or choice men pursue, and though they jostle against each other, for men of the same profession are seldom friends, yet there is a much greater number of their fellow creatures with whom they never clash. But women are very differently situated with respect to each other, for they are all rivals. Before marriage it is their business to please men, and after, with a few exceptions, they follow the same scent, with all the persevering pertinacity of instinct. Even virtuous women never forget their sex in company, for they are forever trying to make themselves agreeable. A female beauty and a male wit appear to be equally anxious to draw the attention of the company to themselves, and the animosity of contemporary wits is proverbial. Is it then surprising that when the sole ambition of woman centres in beauty and interest gives vanity additional force, perpetual rivalships should ensue. They are all running the same race, and would rise above the virtue of morals if they did not view each other with a suspicious and even envious eye. An immoderate fondness for dress, for pleasure, and for sway are the passions of savages, the passions that occupy those uncivilized beings who have not yet extended the dominion of the mind, or even learned to think with the energy necessary to concatenate that abstract train of thought which produces principles. And that women, from their education and the present state of civilized life, are in the same condition, cannot, I think, be controverted. To laugh at them, then, or satirize the follies of a being who is never to be allowed to act freely from the light of her own reason, 
is as absurd as cruel, for that they who are taught blindly to obey authority will endeavour cunningly to elude it is most natural and certain. Yet let it be proved that they ought to obey man implicitly, and I shall immediately agree that it is woman's duty to cultivate a fondness for dress in order to please, and a propensity to cunning for her own preservation. The virtues, however, which are supported by ignorance, must ever be wavering. The house built on sand could not endure a storm. It is almost unnecessary to draw the inference. If women are to be made virtuous by authority, which is a contradiction in terms, let them be immured in seraglios and watched with a jealous eye. Fear not that the iron will enter into their souls, for the souls that can bear such treatment are made of yielding materials, just animated enough to give life to the body. Matter too soft, a lasting mark to bear, and best distinguished by black, brown, or fair. The most cruel wounds will, of course, soon heal, and they may still people the world and dress to please man, all the purposes which certain celebrated writers have allowed that they were created to fill. Section 13.4 Women are supposed to possess more sensibility and even humanity than men, and their strong attachments and instantaneous emotions of compassion are given as proofs. But the clinging affection of ignorance has seldom anything noble in it, and may mostly be resolved into selfishness as well as the affection of children and brutes. I have known many weak women whose sensibility was entirely engrossed by their husbands, and as for their humanity, it was very faint indeed, or rather it was only a transient emotion of compassion. Humanity does not consist in a squeamish ear, says an eminent orator. It belongs to the mind as well as the nerves. But this kind of exclusive affection, though it degrade the individual, should not be brought forward as a proof of the inferiority of the sex, because it is the natural consequence of confined views. For even women of superior sense, having their attention turned to little employments and private plans, rarely rise to heroism, unless when spurred on by love. And love as an heroic passion, like genius, appears but once in an age. I therefore agree with the moralist who asserts that women have seldom so much generosity as men, and that their narrow affections, to which justice and humanity are often sacrificed, render the sex apparently inferior, especially as they are commonly inspired by men. But I contend that the heart would expand as the understanding gained strength if women were not depressed from their cradles. I know that a little sensibility and great weakness will produce a strong sexual attachment, and that reason must cement friendship. Consequently, I allow that more friendship is to be found in the male than the female world and that men have a higher sense of justice. The exclusive affections of women seem indeed to resemble Cato's most unjust love for his country. He wished to crush Carthage, not to save Rome, but to promote its vain glory. And in general, it is to similar principles that humanity is sacrificed 
for genuine duties support each other. Besides, how can women be just or generous when they are the slaves of injustice? Section 13.5 As the rearing of children, that is, the laying a foundation of sound health, both of body and mind, in the rising generation, has justly been insisted on as the peculiar destination of woman, the ignorance that incapacitates them must be contrary to the order of things, and I contend that their minds can take in much more and ought to do so, or they will never become sensible mothers. Many men attend to the breeding of horses and overlook the management of the stable, who would, strange want of sense and feeling, think themselves degraded by paying any attention to the nursery. Yet how many children are absolutely murdered by the ignorance of women? But when they escape and are neither destroyed by unnatural negligence nor blind fondness, how few are managed properly with respect to the infant mind. So that to break the spirit allowed to become vicious at home, a child is sent to school, and the methods taken there, which must be taken to keep a number of children in order, scatter the seeds of almost every vice in the soil thus forcibly torn up. I have sometimes compared the struggles of these poor children who ought never to have felt restraint, nor would had they been always held in with an even hand, to the despairing plunges of a spirited filly which I have seen breaking on a strand, its feet sinking deeper and deeper in the sand every time it endeavoured to throw its rider, till at last it sullenly submitted. I have always found horses, an animal I am attached to, very tractable when treated with humanity and steadiness, so that I doubt whether the violent methods taken to break them do not essentially injure them. I am, however, certain that a child should never be thus forcibly tamed after it has injudiciously been allowed to run wild. For every violation of justice and reason in the treatment of children weakens their reason. And so early do they catch a character that the base of the moral character, experience leads me to infer, is fixed before their seventh year the period during which women are allowed the sole management of children. Afterwards it too often happens that half the business of education is to correct, and very imperfectly is it done, if done hastily, the faults which they would never have acquired if their mothers had had more understanding. One striking instance of the folly of women must not be omitted. The manner in which they treat servants in the presence of children, permitting them to suppose that they ought to wait on them and bear their humours. A child should always be made to receive assistance from a man or woman as a favour, and as the first lesson of independence they should practically be taught by the example of their mother, not to require that personal attendance which it is an insult to humanity to require when in health, and instead of being led to assume airs of consequence, a sense of their own weakness should first make them feel the natural equality of man. Yet how frequently have I indignantly heard servants imperiously called to put children to bed and sent away again and again because master or miss hung about mamma to stay a little longer. 
thus made slavishly to attend the little idol, all those most disgusting humours were exhibited, which characterise a spoiled child. In short, speaking of the majority of mothers, they leave their children entirely to the care of servants, or because they are their children, treat them as if they were little demigods, though I have always observed that the women who thus idolise their children seldom show common humanity to servants, or feel the least tenderness for any children but their own. It is, however, these exclusive affections and an individual manner of seeing things produced by ignorance which keep women for ever at a stand with respect to improvement and make many of them dedicate their lives to their children only to weaken their bodies and spoil their tempers, frustrating also any plan of education that a more rational father may adopt. For unless a mother concurs, the father who restrains will ever be considered as a tyrant. But fulfilling the duties of a mother, a woman with a sound constitution may still keep her person scrupulously neat and assist to maintain her family if necessary, or by reading and conversations with both sexes indiscriminately improve her mind. For nature has so wisely ordered things that did women suckle their children, they would preserve their own health, and there would be such an interval between the birth of each child that we should seldom see a house full of babes. And did they pursue a plan of conduct and not waste their time in following the fashionable vagaries of dress, the management of their household and children need not shut them out from literature, nor prevent their attaching themselves to a science with that steady eye which strengthens the mind, or practising one of the fine arts that cultivate the taste. But visiting to display finery, card-playing and balls, not to mention the idle bustle of morning trifling, draw women from their duty to render them insignificant, to render them pleasing, according to the present acceptation of the word, to every man but their husband. For a round of pleasures in which the affections are not exercised cannot be said to improve the understanding, though it be erroneously called seeing the world. Yet the heart is rendered cold and averse to duty by such a senseless intercourse, which becomes necessary from habit even when it has ceased to amuse. But till more equality be established in society, till ranks are confounded and women freed, we shall not see that dignified domestic happiness, the simple grandeur of which cannot be relished by ignorant or vitiated minds, nor will the important task of education ever be properly begun till the person of a woman is no longer preferred to her mind. For it would be as wise to expect corn from tares or figs from thistles as that a foolish, ignorant woman should be a good mother. Section 13.6 It is not necessary to inform the sagacious reader, now I enter on my concluding reflections, that the discussion of this subject merely consists in opening a few simple principles and clearing away the rubbish which obscured them. But, as all readers are not sagacious, I must be allowed to add some explanatory remarks to bring the subject home to reason, to that sluggish reason which supinely takes opinions on trust and obstinately supports them to spare itself the labour of thinking.
moralists have unanimously agreed that unless virtue be nursed by liberty, it will never attain due strength. And what they say of man, I extend to mankind, insisting that in all cases, morals must be fixed on immutable principles, and that the being cannot be termed rational or virtuous, who obeys any authority but that of reason, to render women truly useful members of society, I argue that they should be led by having their understandings cultivated on a large scale to acquire a rational affection for their country, founded on knowledge, because it is obvious that we are little interested about what we do not understand and to render this general knowledge of due importance, I have endeavoured to show that private duties are never properly fulfilled unless the understanding enlarges the heart, and that public virtue is only an aggregate of private. But the distinctions established in society undermine both by beating out the solid gold of virtue till it becomes only the tinsel covering of vice. For whilst wealth renders a man more respectable than virtue, wealth will be sought before virtue. And whilst women's persons are caressed, when a childish simper shows an absence of mind, the mind will lie fallow. Yet true voluptuousness must proceed from the mind, for what can equal the sensations produced by mutual affection, supported by mutual respect? What are the cold or feverish caresses of appetite, but sin embracing death, compared with the modest overflowings of a pure heart and exalted imagination? Yes, let me tell the libertine of fancy, when he despises understanding in woman, that the mind which he disregards gives life to the enthusiastic affection from which rapture, short-lived as it is, alone can flow, and that without virtue a sexual attachment must expire like a tallow candle in the socket, creating intolerable disgust. To prove this I need only observe that men who have wasted great part of their lives with women and with whom they have sought for pleasure with eager thirst entertain the meanest opinion of the sex. Virtue, true refiner of joy, if foolish men were to fright thee from earth in order to give loose to all their appetites without a check, some sensual white of taste would scale the heavens to invite thee back, to give a zest to pleasure. That women at present are by ignorance rendered foolish or vicious is, I think, not to be disputed and that the most salutary effects tending to improve mankind might be expected from a revolution in female manners appears at least with a face of probability to rise out of the observation. For as marriage has been termed the parent of those endearing charities which draw man from the brutal herd, the corrupting intercourse that wealth, idleness and folly produce between the sexes is more universally injurious to morality than all the other vices of mankind collectively considered. To adulterous lust the most sacred duties are sacrificed because before marriage men by a promiscuous intimacy with women learn to consider love as a selfish gratification, learned to separate it not only from esteem 
but from the affection merely built on habit, which mixes a little humanity with it. Justice and friendship are also set at defiance, and that purity of taste is vitiated, which would naturally lead a man to relish an artless display of affection rather than affected airs. But that noble simplicity of affection, which dares to appear unadorned, has few attractions for the libertine, though it be the charm which by cementing the matrimonial tie secures to the pledges of a warmer passion the necessary parental attention. For children will never be properly educated till friendship subsists between parents. Virtue flies from a house divided against itself, and a whole legion of devils take up their residence there. The affection of husbands and wives cannot be pure when they have so few sentiments in common, and when so little confidence is established at home as must be the case when their pursuits are so different. That intimacy from which tenderness should flow will not, cannot, subsist between the vicious. Contending, therefore, that the sexual distinction which men have so warmly insisted upon is arbitrary, I have dwelt on an observation that several sensible men with whom I have conversed on the subject allowed to be well-founded, and it is simply this, that the little chastity to be found amongst men and consequent disregard of modesty tend to degrade both sexes. And further, that the modesty of women, characterized as such, will often be only the artful veil of wantonness, instead of being the natural reflection of purity, till modesty be universally respected. From the tyranny of man, I firmly believe, the greater number of female follies proceed, and the cunning, which I allow, makes at present a part of their character, I likewise have repeatedly endeavoured to prove, is produced by oppression. Were not dissenters, for instance, a class of people with strict truth characterised as cunning, and may I not lay some stress on this fact to prove that when any power but reason curbs the free spirit of man, dissimulation is practised, and the various shifts of art are naturally called forth. Great attention to decorum, which was carried to a degree of scrupulosity, and all that puerile bustle about trifles and consequential solemnity, which Butler's caricature of a dissenter brings before the imagination, shaped their persons as well as their minds in the mould of prim littleness. I speak collectively, for I know how many ornaments to human nature have been enrolled amongst sectaries, yet I assert that the same narrow prejudice for their sect which women have for their families prevailed in the dissenting part of the community, however worthy in other respects, and also that the same timid prudence or headstrong efforts often disgrace the exertions of both. Oppression thus formed many of the features of their character perfectly to coincide with that of the oppressed half of mankind. For is it not notorious that dissenters were, like women, fond of deliberating together and asking advice of each other, till by a complication of little contrivances some little end was brought about? A similar attention to preserve their reputation was conspicuous in the dissenting and female world, and was produced 
by a similar cause. Asserting the rights which women, in common with men, ought to contend for, I have not attempted to extenuate their faults, but to prove them to be the natural consequence of their education and station in society. If so, it is reasonable to suppose that they will change their character and correct their vices and follies when they are allowed to be free in a physical, moral and civil sense. Let woman share the rights and she will emulate the virtues of man, for she must grow more perfect when emancipated or justify the authority that chains such a weak being to her duty. If the latter, it will be expedient to open a fresh trade with Russia for whips, a present which a father should always make to his son-in-law on his wedding day, that a husband may keep his whole family in order by the same means. And without any violation of justice, reign wielding this sceptre sole master of his house because he is the only being in it who has reason the divine indefeasible earthly sovereignty breathed into man by the master of the universe allowing this position women have not any inherent rights to claim and by the same rule their duties vanish for rights and duties are inseparable. Be just, then, O ye men of understanding, and mark not more severely what women do amiss than the vicious tricks of the horse or the ass for whom ye provide provender and allow her the privileges of ignorance to whom ye deny the rights of reason. Or... Ye will be worse than Egyptian taskmasters, expecting virtue where nature has not given understanding.